We are now recording. Great, thank you. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us. We have a quorum. We are gonna get going with a roll call shortly. Uh, I wanna announce that this is a special meeting of the State Bar of California Board of Trustees. Today is Friday, February 25th. We have a lot to do um, in just the right amount of time, I'm hoping, and it's good to see everyone. Uh, Madam Secretary, can we have a roll call, please? Broughton? Here. Chen? Cisneros? Here. De La Cruz? Delen? Duran? Here. Ganong? Here. Salag? Here. <clears throat> Here. Shelby? Present. Sol? Stallings? Here. Tony? Present. You have a quorum. Great, thank you. Uh, this is the uh, time of the meeting for public comment. Uh, we encourage, invite, and welcome members of the public to offer their input on items on today's special meeting agenda. If you would like to address the board on any item on today's agenda, please indicate your interest by using the raise hand function in Zoom if you're on the video platform. If you're on phone, I believe that is star nine um, and not star six, star nine. And so we'll let uh, folks indicate their interest. Um, and that'll tell me, and tell me um, how I wanna uh, and need to allocate the time this morning. We've got 44 folks in attendance, which is great to see. And it looks like um, people are raising their hands little by little. So far we have 12. Um, I'm gonna assume that that number is going to go up. So uh, given that we will allot two minutes for individual speakers so that we can make sure to allow um, as many people as want to, uh, to address the board. Um, and we will get going and I will ask staff's assistance in recognizing um, those folks who have raised their hand in the order that they've done so. All right, thank you, Chair Duran. Uh, we're gonna go in the order that the hands uh, appeared in the list. The first hand that appeared was David Freeman Angstrom. Uh, you have a microphone available to you and you've got two minutes, thank you. Good morning to all of you. I'm David Freeman Angstrom and I'm a California lawyer and litigator. I'm a professor at Stanford Law School and I'm a member of the Closing the Justice Gap Working Group. And I'd just like to thank you for hearing me on this issue this morning. I'd like to make two brief points. Uh, the first is that as a member of the working group over the past year, I've had the opportunity and frankly, the great privilege to work with really terrific colleagues, some from California, some not, who have all volunteered their time and considerable expertise to this effort. And my belief is that we will need all of that expertise to develop a rigorous recommendation for you to consider on this complex and important set of issues. Second, as you may know, I helped lead an effort in December to send a letter from several members of the working group to the two Judiciary Committee chairs asking to meet with them or their staffs. And in the conversations that resulted, I was gratified to hear that their intent was not to shut down the working group. So I'm glad to see the recommendation before this body outlining a plan for the group to continue its work. And I, and I suspect my fellow working group appointees as well, stand ready to contribute to the next chapter of the working group and to help generate a rigorous set of recommendations for how the, set of, the state of California might widen access to legal help for its people. Thanks. Thank you. The next person that we'll recognize is uh, Nancy Drabel. Ms. Drabel, your Thanks. microphone. Is... There you have it, go ahead. You Thank minutes. you. My name is Nancy Drabble, and I am the CEO of Consumer Attorneys of California. Thanks for the opportunity to comment. At this juncture, Consumer Attorneys of California does not believe that the very minor modifications suggested to the working group address its fundamental defects. The suggested changes are window dressing that do not address the biased and unfair nature of the group. And we do not believe that further work of this group will have credibility in the legislature or elsewhere. 
to have any further productive substantive discussions, we believe that the current group should be thanked for their work to date and excused. As part of any further discussion, there should be a pause to examine the serious corporate abuses that have recently developed in Arizona before considering slashing longtime consumer protections and undermining the ethical constraints of the attorney-client relationship. Any further substantive discussions would be more productive in the normal process, including a wider variety of stakeholders, including legal services, and attorneys who actually represent real life consumers who are harmed. Uh, to date, we feel that many of the comments by the public and including folks who represent actual consumers have been dismissed and ignored because it does not comport with the predetermined goal of some members of the committee. So we implore the board to disband the current working group, which does not preclude further work, substantive work on these issues as part of the normal process. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Drabble. The next speaker will be uh, is listed as Skitiero Consulting. Your microphone is available to you. You have two minutes, thank you. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Hi. Um, prior to the January 6th insurrection, I went to the police station and asked for assistance because a group of influential members of society, including an attorney, were trying to coerce someone close to me to do unspeakable things. I am not an attorney. I'm a Latina, an immigrant, a member of NAACP and Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, and a registered voter. Does that matter? Officer Shiza laughed at me and refused to take a statement. I had to go over his head to file a complaint. I agree that there is a need to review the unscrupulous actors. However, this is not the charge of the closing the justice gap. I read the letter from Senator Umberg and believe that he has been completely misinformed. He stated that the bar has chosen to divert from the core mission of protecting the public, blah, blah, blah. Well, I am part of the public and it seems that I had to protect you. I take great offense to the accusation that the bar and members of the committee have wasted resources, in other words, taxpayer dollars on this program. That is not the case. Money, 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 money. This all comes down to money. If you review the public comments in the videos, you see public speaker Annette att attended at least two sessions where she stated that she took out $130,000 in student loans to become an attorney and threatened to sue the bar if this sandbox was implemented because, quote, it would ruin her. I too have taken out student loans and mine were for the purpose of saving lives. My last documented salary is 138,000 and feel that not providing people with the opportunity to have the freedom to choose where they obtain assistance would impact my mental health and ability to earn a living. Does that mean that I have the, I can have the bar on my behalf? I feel that- I'm sorry, ma'am, your time is up. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Katira, for your, or thank you, uh, speaker, for your comments. I'm gonna use this opportunity just to let the record reflect that several of the um, trustees who weren't present at the roll call are now present with us. I believe it's Trustee Sowell and Chen. Madam Secretary, have I missed anybody? No, that's correct. Great, thank you. So returning to the speakers, um, I see the next person up will be Karen Thomas Stefana. You have a microphone available to you as soon as you mute it. You unmute it. You've got two minutes. Thank you. Uh, yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, yes. Karen Thomas Stefano. I'm an administrative director of the Consumer Protection Policy Center at the University of San Diego Law School. I've read the memo uh, titled board, board Response. And I'm thrilled that staff recommends moving forward with the working group. Uh, I do have one concern on page four. Uh, the, the memo suggests adjusting the composition of the working group. And 
so as to limit it to those with California specific experience. And that concerns my office because adjusting the composition in that manner is going to cut the working group off from valuable input from people from other states who have uh, who have worked on sandboxes. And uh, I would urge uh, you to reconsider altering that composition. And, uh, you know, we just don't want to lose that valuable perspective of, of these out of state people who, who have uh, worked on worked on reforms. And otherwise, um, I believe you know CPPC's position uh, because we CC'd the working group co-chair. You have 20 seconds remaining, thank you. Uh, as well as Mr. Duran and Ms. Wilson uh, and our December 16th response to Senator Umberg and Assemblymember Stone's December 7 letter. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker will be Aaron Joyce. Your microphone's available to you. As soon as you unmute it, you'll have two minutes. I appreciate that, Aaron Joyce, and I'm Thank speaking you. on my own behalf. Um, I am also the chair of the Paraprofessional Working Group Study Group for LA County Bar Association. And you're well aware, based on our written comments, that we are um, strongly against these proposals. And while I've read the staff proposal to narrow the closing the justice gap working groups charge, um, I don't think it's really going to solve the problem. You could see they wanna um, take out the California influence and reconstitute the members of the working group. And they wanna drop the subcommittee meetings because they have to admit that 12 staff members have been devoting a substantial amount of their time to these outside issues that are not the primary charge of the state bar. The primary charge at state bar is to protect the public. And I can say that having been a former prosecutor in office of chief trial counsel for 18 years, and the, and the bar is diverted into other matters here. Instead of taking care of client complaints that are coming in and are not being timely, appropriately or cost-effectively resolved. Just this week, we had a Daily Journal article with the $4 million projected deficit with the state bar. It is not time to take on a parallel discipline system at incredible cost, which will undermine the legal profession entirely. What this is looking to do is to allow non-attorneys to own law firms and to provide legal services directly to the public without proper oversight and without public protection. Have 20 seconds remaining, thank you. So I would strongly urge that, especially in view of the fact that Sacramento is not gonna be looking kindly on these proposals, that no further resources of the state bar be diverted to this boondoggle. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker will be Daniel Forosan. Mr. Forosan, you have a microphone available to you. If you unmute it, please. You will have two minutes. Good morning and thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. Wonderful. First and foremost, I wanted to thank everyone working the state bar. I know you guys have to sit through these phone calls, listen to a bunch of people bicker and tell you what to do. I'm sure it's a thankless job and I appreciate you doing that. I also wanted to say, I do think the justice gap is something worth investigating. I do think the justice gap is something that is worthwhile and I commend you for moving forward in that direction and attempt to close it. What you're doing is worthwhile. The manner in which it's being done, however, is where I take issue. As I see it, some of the proposals that are being made are designed to allow an influx of attorneys to fill in justice gaps. I'm not exactly sure that allowing a bunch of corporations to own law firms is going to do that. Realistically, we're going to see a bunch more personal injury billboards in the state of California. You know, there's plenty of them as it is. I think a lot of these corporations are going to get involved for profiteering. As a result, the ethics of the state bar as well, not the state bars and you guys, but the ethics of the legal practice in the state of California will be corroded. As it is already, we have plenty of ethical dilemmas issues and things that need to be addressed and maybe things that weren't addressed previously and are now a stain on our profession as attorneys. I would urge the state bar to focus on what we have already and move forward in ways that can close the justice gap 
without also throwing the baby out with the bathwater and allowing profiteering corporations to come in and own law firms. As it is, the ethics issues are already there. I can only imagine it will get that much worse when you allow business people to come in and have borderline control over a law firm. I yield the rest of my time and thank you for listening. Thank you very much. The next speaker will be uh, Mr. James Heiting. Mr. Heiting, you have a microphone. As soon as you unmute it, you've got two minutes. Thank you. Thank you, James Heiting, a uh, former member of the Board of Governors of the State Bar of California and former president of the State Bar in 2005-06. Wanted to discuss this and say this would involve relaxation of the regulatory prohibitions on non-attorney ownership, of course. The hypothesis is advanced that non-attorney investments in law firms could have a positive impact on access and legal services. However, the legal services then could be standardized and more available to the general public at a cheaper rate and offered more widely. It might sound good, however, it seems somewhat odd to me that the Consumer Protection Agency, which is the role of the State Bar, uh, currently, would move to expose consumers to services that have relaxed regulatory prohibitions and standards. This is especially true when these ideas have been tried in other places and no public benefit has been demonstrated. Especially uh, telling is an article by Nick Robinson, when lawyers don't get all the profits, non-lawyer ownership, access, and professionalism, that studied this uh, proposal in Australia and in the United Kingdom. In a very short time, uh, it was found that those alternative business structures, those corporation ownerships, uh, controlled over a third of the market share of all personal injury claims in the Uni United Kingdom. However, even with such a share of those claims held by non-attorneys, there was no finding, no finding that this resulted in any greater access, reduced fees, or improved results for potential clients. Mr. Heiding, you have 20 seconds remaining. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. I think the focus of the, of the State Bar would be better served to make the practice better and more attractive for lawyers. Uh, we, we have plenty of lawyers in this state, and if you make the practice more attractive to them to go into these slots and make this more available to clients and uh, serve their client protection, I think we would be better off. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. The next speaker will be Andy Fields. Good morning. Thank you. My name is Andy Fields, and I'm an attorney in the state of California. The regulatory sandbox could become an open invitation for profit-driven corporations, hedge funds, or other <clears throat> others to offer legal services or directly practice law without the appropriate legal training, regulatory oversight, protections inherent to the attorney-client relationship, or adequate discipline to the detriment of Californians in the need of legal assistance. I also agree that continuing this work the state bar is diverting attention and precious resources from improving the attorney discipline system. That should be the main function of the state bar and should be the primary focus of any resource spent in the name of public protection. I also agree that the pro proposals to permit individuals and corporations that are not licensed attorneys to participate in the sandbox pose a very significant risk to consumers by creating conflicts of interest that are difficult to overcome and infringe on the core obligations of attorneys to their clients. The fact is, we all support increasing access to justice. We just disagree on how the state bar is going about this goal. I believe that our resources should go to the proven programs offering access to justice and legal services that are now underfunded. Rather than, than diverting these precious resources to the benefit of big tech firms and outside corporations, advertising firms who are just trying to get a foothold in California through this sandbox proposal. Thank you for my time. Thank you very much. The next speaker will be Mr. Tom Gordon. Mr. Gordon, you have your microphone is still muted. If you would unmute your microphone, there you go. You have two minutes. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Tom Gordon. I'm the executive director of Responsive Law, uh, which is actually our full legal name is Consumers for a Responsive Legal System. We are a national nonprofit organization working to improve access for consumers of legal services. Uh, my initial reason to comment here was to thank the board for allowing the working group to continue uh, and to comment on some of the uh, changes to the composition of the working group that uh, along the lines of what Ms. Stefano commented. But I do feel the need uh, to divert from that for a moment and just address who you're hearing from today. Uh, you've heard a lot of opposition from a lot of people, all of whom are lawyers or representing lawyer organizations. Uh, the uh, Consumer Attorneys of California mentions that they are a 
tries to pass them off as a consumer organization. They're an attorney organization. Their membership is restricted to lawyers. And if you look back at the comments you've received over the last few months on this matter, uh, if you look at the comments from the public, uh, not from lawyers who more easily find the time and interest to comment on these matters, comments from the public have tended to be overwhelmingly in favor of the proposals of the working group. Furthermore, this is not a, uh, an issue right now of whether these proposals should take effect. This is an issue of whether this working group should be allowed to continue its work. And you as the board of trustees will have a chance to review that uh, work and make a decision at a later point when the working group finishes its work. Uh, one brief comment, <clears throat> excuse me, on uh, the, the proposed revision to staff of the uh, working group or volunteers. Uh, the requirement would have the effect, whether intentional or not, of uh, consolidating power within the working group of representatives of the trial bar at the expense of experience from uh, other areas. Mr. Gordon, you have 15 seconds, thank you. This. Uh, we uh, have, a, there's a vague definition, undefined term of California specific experience that uh, according to some of the language there may uh, eliminate a large number of relevant experiences from the working group's work. I see my time is up, thank you very much. Thank you very much. The next speaker will be Ms. Elaine Torres. Ms. Torres, your microphone is now available. You have two minutes, thank you. Great, good morning. My name is Elaine Torres. Thank you for listening to my comment today. In my experience as an attorney, I've met hundreds of individuals who were indigent or undocumented, who have been tricked into paying thousands of dollars to so-called legal professionals who've misrepresented their qualifications and claim to be linked to the state bar in some capacity. I believe the Sandbox Committee, although they may have good intentions, the program will only further the risk of fraud and misrepresentation to those individuals who are in need. The risk far exceeds the benefits of any access to justice the Sandbox Committee claims it will provide through its program Closing the Justice Gap. Access to justice should be funded through programs that already exist. The program does not add to the legal profession, but I believe it takes away from existing programs that have proven to be effective even while being underfunded, such as legal aid, local nonprofits, and low bono clinics. The State Bar of California should focus on improving and funding these organizations that have adequate safeguards for ensuring safe and equitable access to justice. As such, I urge the Board of Trustees to consider disbanding the Sandbox Committee and explore other proven avenues for closing the justice gap by increasing affordable and equitable access to justice within programs that already exist. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. The next speaker is Natalie Knowlton. Ms. Knowlton, your microphone is available. You have two minutes, thank you. Thank you, can everyone hear me? Yes. Wonderful, thank you. And thank you for the opportunity to speak. My name is Natalie Knowlton and I'm the Director of Special Projects at the Institute for the Advancement of the American Legal System at the University of Denver. We are a nonprofit, nonpartisan research institute supporting empirically informed decision-making in the legal system. I applaud the state bar's measured and thoughtful response to the concerns raised by California lawmakers. The disruption that the working group has experienced as a result of legislative interference is unfortunate, but I am heartened to see the bars recommending the continuation of this important work. Regarding the issue of working group composition, the diverse experience and perspectives of those members lawmakers consider to lack California specific experience was intentional, designed to avoid the groupthink of non diverse expertise. While I am more than confident that there are qualified and capable volunteers in California to fill out the ranks of the reconstituted working group, I hope that California specific experience is not read as an invitation to fill the group's ranks with California consumer attorneys who are aligned and outspoken against any changes that bring even perceived competition into this space. More broadly, we cannot jump ahead to the purely hypothetical harms that commentators have raised today. A committee on the sandbox is not the sandbox, and it is misleading when these efforts are conflated. We cannot stop this exploratory effort because of unrealized harms from a proposal that still must route through a complex chain of approval. Without data, what you are hearing today, including from me, are merely opinions of hypothetical futures. Only evidence through the control, controlled experimentation that this working group is exploring will give any of us certainty. Finally, I encourage the State Bar and those members who will remain on the reconstituted group to demand that California-specific experience also includes those with perhaps the most important voices. Californians who have navigated the legal system without any legal help. There is no more relevant California specific experience than theirs and no attorney or other legal system insider can speak on their behalf, despite re repeated claims that they do so. I'm excited to hear how the state bar moves forward with this important effort. Work towards public protection often conflicts with trade protection and I'm glad to see the state bar moving forward courageously and 
proposition. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. The next speaker will be Susan Swan. Ms. Susan Swan, Ms. Swan, your microphone is active. You have two minutes. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Susan Swan. I've been a member of the California State Bar, a practicing attorney for over 16 years. For the last 13 years, I've exclusively represented employees. I currently have my own firm with two employee associates. I share the concerns in the December 7th, 2021 letter from the Senate and Judiciary Committee. This process is diverting precious resources, which should go towards improving the attorney discipline system, which is the best way to protect the public. There could be significant risk to allowing for-profit corporations and other non-attorneys coming in and taking care of the people that me and other attorneys serve. There would be a lack of oversight and there's a significant risk of conflicts of interest. We should be instead putting our resources towards proven programs that are underfunded, such as the San Diego Volunteer Lawyer Program, where I volunteered and also interned when I was a law student. It's been said that as an attorney who represents employees that it's been said by other speakers today that my voice should be discounted. But I am a person who speaks to people who are in dire need of legal help every day. And I understand what their needs are. And I understand just how complex ethically their needs can be. And we shouldn't be risking that to people who don't have the same ethical requirements that attorneys have. It's also been said that this is all just hypothetical, what we're warning about. It's not hypothetical because we've seen the problems in Arizona and in Utah, and we shouldn't be going that route for Californians. Ms. Swan, you have 20 seconds. Thank you. Thank you. I think that we should explore other proven avenues for increasing access to justice and disband the Sandbox Committee. Thank you for listening to me. Thank you. The next speaker will be Mr. Bill Swearinger. Mr. Swearinger, your microphone is active. You have two minutes. Thank you. Good morning. I'm a 41-year California lawyer. I've engaged in general practice uh, because I had to learn things as they came up when clients needed them. Uh, I echo the remarks of Nancy Drabble, of Elaine Torres, and Aaron Joyce. Um, the problem with being a lawyer these days is that it is less and less a profession and more and more a business but we need to go back to the professional model. Uh, the problem with having people who are not attorneys handle matters is that in many cases, in an immigration case, in a divorce case, uh, subtle legal issues come up that a paraprofessional simply would not catch. And those items not being caught and having somebody else looking at them can create a significant amount of harm for human beings. With respect to the existing uh, availability of legal help for people, I think that is a matter for the state legislature to advocate funds for legal aid for self-help programs at the courthouse and other similar nonprofit funding of nonprofit organizations where lawyers are employed. You have 20 seconds remaining, thank you. And also we must not forget that there is a significant use of paralegal by lawyers who are in charge of things where the paralegal is making doing a lot of work at an affordable rate for the clients. And this is simply not a matter of the state bar, but it's a matter for the state legislature to address. Thank you. Financially. The next speaker will be Molly McKibben. Ms. Molly, Ms. McKibben, uh, your microphone is active. You have two minutes. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Molly McKibben, and I wish to comment on agenda item 703 regarding the Sandbox Committee. I'm a plaintiff civil litigation attorney who has also volunteered for many years with the Sojourn Domestic Violence Legal Aid Clinic. I regularly interact with clients who have criminal, civil, or family law cases without representation. I understand the need to close the justice gap and help clients who cannot afford an hourly attorney. 
I completely agree and support the concerns raised by the chairs of the Senate and Assembly Judiciary Committees. Allowing non-attorneys to practice law and own law firms is not the answer. It is vitally important that litigants be represented by professionals who have had the legal training and education necessary to provide legal advice. I've seen firsthand how convoluted a pro se client's case can become when they obtain inaccurate legal advice from friends or family who have no legal training. The current proposals will do nothing to lower attorney's fees, but instead will result in lower quality legal services for consumers. Moreover, allowing non-lawyer ownership of law firms does nothing to close the get justice gap. There's clearly a conflict of interest between non-lawyer owners and practicing lawyers where they will have different priorities. Owners may want to maximize profits or reduce risk, and lawyers have a fiduciary and ethical obligation to do what's in the best interest of their clients. What is to stop companies who put defective products out on the market from opening up their own law firms of non-lawyers to capture cases of potential claimants and settle them for pennies on the dollar? A better approach to address the justice gap would be to fund resources for underserved communities, such as court- We have 20 seconds remaining, thank you. Such as court programs and nonprofits like the legal aid clinic that I volunteer at so that there are more attorneys available to offer representation and advice to clients. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Ms. Jennifer Ostertag. Ms. Ostertag, your microphone is active. You have two minutes. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Jennifer Ostertag, and I, I'm a 20 plus year attorney in California. I'm also an immigrant. The State Bar of California is, is far uh, the largest state bar in the country. The bar program are financed primarily by fees paid by attorney and applicants to practice law. To practice law in California, state bar applicants must pass a rigorous three-day examination to test their knowledge of the rules of professional conduct and a screening for moral character. The exam is considered one of the toughest in the nation and is administered by the committee of the bar examiner. The state bar discipline is designed to protect the public, the courts, and the profession from attorneys who violate ethics, ethics rules covering their professional conduct. The proposal to permit individuals and corporations that are not licensed attorneys to participate in the sandbox pose a very significant risk to consumers by creating conflicts of interest that are difficult to overcome and infringe on the core obligation of attorneys to their client. I support the concern raised by the chair of the Senate and Assembly Judiciary Committees in their December 7, 2021 letter. I support increasing access to justice but I disagree how the state bar is going about this goal. I also volunteer for many uh, clinic support for battered women and I do a lot of other volunteer work. I believe that our resources should go towards proven programs, offering access to justice and legal services that are now underfunded. Rather than diverting precious resources for the benefits of big tech firms, outside corporation and advertising firms we are trying yep. to get a foothold in California. You have 20 seconds remaining, thank you. At minimum, we should work, we should pause the committee and, and look at an examination of what's going on in Arizona and Utah, where advertising firms and corporations are already taking advantage of deregulation, deregulation efforts there to increase their profit. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker uh, is Ms. Jeannie Harrison. Ms. Harrison, your microphone is active. You have two minutes, thank you. Thank you, this is Jeannie Harrison. I am um, the immediate past president of the Consumer Attorneys Association of Los Angeles. Um, the state bars system proposes the paraprofessional working group and the closing the justice working, uh, closing the justice gap working group proposes to create and enshrine a two tier justice system with the rich and companies having top lawyer representation and the poor or middle income having inferior representation by non-lawyers. This is enshrining a David versus Goliath in structure, uh, structure instead of making more Goliaths available to the poor and middle income individuals. This absolutely is what's happening here. Um, I-A-A-L-S, uh, whose work I understand. Um, however, I have to point out that it is absolutely funded by Exxon, State Farm, and I note 
that the institute, the Chambers Institute for Legal Reform has been removed from IAALS's website. Uh, but these are the companies that have been funding IAALS's work, which I have never seen to be in my 30 years of experience, uh, pro-individual or pro-trial um, uh, against those corporations. In addition, I want to say that the uh, Boston Consulting Group has studied the effects of deregulating legal services in England and Wales and has specifically found you have 20 based on remaining. Thank you. the 10 years of study and data that in fact, prices do not drop for consumers. Uh, quality does not increase for consumers, but money, more money is made for corporations. The fact is these programs that have been put together by the state bar and are studied by the working groups are results oriented and the revisions are putting lipstick thank, on a pig. Thank you. It, thank you, Ms. Harrison. The next speaker uh, is listed only as Myra. Myra, your microphone is active. You have two minutes. Thank you. Hi, good morning. Thank you so much for um, accepting my comment. Um, I've practiced immigration law in California for 14 years. I'm an alumna of the UCLA Public Interest Law Program. I went into this profession because I care about immigrants' rights, women's rights, and the rights of workers. I was undocumented myself, so it's a community that I know well. I've entered in just about every legal aid organization in the LA area, and I routinely provide uh, pro bono work. As an immigration attorney in California, I can tell you that this proposal will enhance the problem of notario fraud. Notario fraud is rampant. The harm is real. It's not hypothetical. And notario fraud affects vulnerable, population, vulnerable populations, uh, the undocumented, the elderly, immigrants in general. If you want to increase access to low cost legal services, um, please invest more money in legal aid foundations with adequate safeguards. Um, you know, let's continue to invest in protecting the vulnerable. Uh, I yield the remainder of my time. Thank you. Thank you. Chair Duran, we don't have any more hands raised. Okay, thank you very much for your assistance. Uh, Mr. Sorry, Mr. one final hand that just went up right as I was saying that. Should we? Sure, of course, Mr. Gold. And, a follow and another <laughs> hand followed that. Shall we make okay. these the final two? Yes, please. All right, uh, Mr. Gould, it looks like. Uh, yes. Your microphone's you. active, you have two minutes, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'm a lawyer in private practice in California since 1979 and active in bar activities, mainly at the Beverly Hills Bar Association. Um, I wanted to address the issue of non-lawyer ownership of law firms. Um, I don't believe that the concept of replacing business ethics with the ethics of lawyers learn in three years of law school and through their terms of practice is going to be uh, fruitful for what you're intending to accomplish. I see it really as a disaster. There's no way to control these ethical issues. Um, the motivations for profit are simply not the same. Uh, consumers won't be protected. Um, and the people who are not able to get and afford legal assistance now are really not going to get the assistance that they need. Um, I don't think that you are looking at creating a system that can control those ethical problems and those motivations that uh, people will have when non-lawyers own law firms. Um, and uh, I don't really think you plan to control them or that you'll be able to control them. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Eli Melamed. Mr. Melamed, your microphone is Still muted. Once you activate your microphone, you'll have two minutes. There you there go. There we go. Can you can you hear me? Yes, we can. Good morning, everyone. This is Eli Melamed. I'm a California attorney, and you know I, I won't rehash everything that's been said. There's been a lot of good po points made on both sides. My position is that the committee should not be reinstated, but I will say that in the interest of promoting justice. In the interest of promoting access to justice, rather, I think it makes sense to only reinstate the committee to the extent that there is a, a much more granular determination of the actual and specific goals to be determined, you know, to, to be achieved by the sort of program that's been floated. You know, the problem is a lot of what we're hearing ultimately boils down to it's not specific what is going to be 
really encouraged and how it's going to be regulated. And I think if we can get to a framework of what types of representation, what areas, you know, what cost structures, what caps on, on representation, scope, fees, et cetera, et cetera, I think that actually might make sense and will be something that can actually bridge the gap between the people who are on both sides of the issue. You know, the one thing that we haven't heard or that I haven't seen in everything I've read has been specifically determining what the the areas are of justice that need to that need greater access and how any sort of sandbox is going to do that. You know, there has to be a framework to take this forward. And the fact that it's vague and basically open-ended is what I think raises a lot of problems. People talking about fraud, people talking about how costs won't come down, people talking about how there's going to be a lot of people taken advantage of. And I think that is mainly because there isn't enough of a framework to actually limit. You have 20 seconds remaining. Thank you. Thank you. There isn't enough of a framework to actually limit how the the implementation of this system or, or the presumed or contemplated system would go forward to protect the the consumers and protect lawyers frank, frankly from unfair competition uh that would otherwise destroy the entire practice thank you thank for you very much mr melamed we shared your i apologize there was one final hand um uh mr okay. jose, we're about 45 minutes in let's let's go ahead and take it and that will be the last one please mr jose castaneda your microphone is still muted once you activate it you'll have two minutes Mr. Castaneda, there we go. Your microphone is active. You have two minutes. Thank you. I'm sorry we're not hearing anything. Mr. Castaneda, are you speaking? Still nothing? I'm seeing your microphone as muted once more and active again. Mr. Castaneda? Go ahead, sir. Okay, there, there must be some technical difficulty. We apologize for that. We're gonna uh, move on with our agenda, um, which takes us to uh, my oral report. Um, as, the, as the board knows, and as we just heard, uh, there's quite a bit happening on um, a couple fronts. Um, one of the reasons for uh, this meeting today uh, was ostensibly or is ostensibly to address those some off cycle business that we that we have to uh, complete today. So those two specific things are uh, the budgetary items that are on today's agenda, which we knew about at our um, January meeting. Um, and the strategic planning uh, process continues. And so I, I really want to thank each of the trustees for taking time out um, from our normal schedule to uh, devote to this meeting and to preparation for this meeting and for your anticipated um, participation today. I, I also want to thank the members of the public who uh, have shown up to uh, address us today and, and, and um, who have addressed us through other avenues, whether it be uh, written communications by email or letter, um, phone calls that some of us have received. There's been a lot of work um, on this important issue of access to justice as represented by the Closing the Justice Gap Working Group and the Paraprofessionals Working Group. We have items on our agenda today for each of those. Um, and so I just want to thank everyone for their very thoughtful uh, participation uh, and, and um, sharing of their views. I encourage the board to engage in a, a robust um, and meaningful discussion later on, and I look forward to that. Um, I do want to uh, remind folks who uh, were at our, um, who may, have, may or may not have heard that our general counsel, Vanessa Holton, has announced uh, her retirement from the state bar after many, many years of service. And at a later time and in an appropriate fashion, we will certainly uh, thank Vanessa for her uh, very, very good and diligent work on behalf of the state bar. But in the meantime, since she's given us enough warning, um, we have some time to put uh, our heads together for a thoughtful uh, recruitment and search process. And so I'd like to announce that I've appointed a search committee, or I'm hereby appointing a search committee um, consisting of the chairs of the bar's committees to oversee the search process. Uh, the, the bar has already uh, engaged the services of Bob Marine Associates, the recruiting uh, firm that recently assisted us successfully with the executive director 
and the chief trial counsel searches. So I look forward to working with those fine professionals again. Um, I encourage each of the trustees, whether or not you're on this committee, um, to please uh, spread the word far and near about this truly, truly exciting opportunity. I, I think the board knows that I serve as a general counsel to public agencies. And it is, um, it is just a, a fun job full of exciting challenges. Uh, and, and I'm um, excited about this opportunity for, for the right person coming along. So uh, please, you know, please, once the uh, job announcement comes out, spread it to your networks, um, do some recruiting, and uh, bring us some good candidates. I would uh, like to, uh, in advance, thank the following individuals for their service on the search committee. Uh, Hyland Chen, who is the chair of RAD. Uh, Arnie Sowell, the chair of finance. Melanie Shelby, the chair of our audit committee. Uh, I will be serving as the chair of the executive committee. And then I've asked Brandon Stallings um, to assist as, as uh, the vice chair of the executive committee and to serve as a tiebreaker uh, in the unlikely event that um, four people couldn't do it. So again, uh, we will launch that process uh, in due course. And I encourage all of you to, to be active about um, finding, finding good candidates. Is there anything um, any of the staff or any of the members of the committee would like to add to this? Uh, this is your opportunity. OK, looking like none. Let's move on to our agenda, which takes us to um, the executive director's oral report. Leah, you have the floor. Yes, and I'll just do a brief um, report as well. I want to. Uh, take some time to recognize all of the staff that worked their first in-person bar exam this week. Um, and I think there may be some uh, test takers still taking the exam uh, today. Um, but the fact that, you know, we haven't heard about major uh, disasters uh, taking place really does um, uh, reflect the Herculean efforts that have been undertaken by this team. Uh, to get back out there on the ground and deliver this exam. And so I want to uh, wish the test takers the best of luck, but truly recognize uh, staff for making that happen. I, I also want to take a moment to acknowledge that today is Dag's last day with the bar. He's retiring and um, this is his last board meeting that he'll be staffing. And so I want to recognize him as well. Um, Dag and I have had the opportunity to work together for over 20 years in uh, different capacities and organizations. And uh, he's been a trusted uh, partner to me along my own career journey. And I will miss him greatly, but I'm really happy for him. So I uh, just wanted to take a moment to say that. Hopefully we can all give Dag a silent uh, clap and recognition. So with that, I think we can move on to the, to the agenda. I see Trustee Shelby raised a hand. I don't know whether that was intentional. Looks like not. Um, but I will uh, take the prerogative of the chair just to add to Leah's voice of thanks um, for your many years of service, Dag. Um, and truly for just being uh, not only a solid professional, but a fine human being, a great dad and father. And I've really enjoyed uh, getting to know you uh, in your role here at the State Bar. I appreciate the help that you've given me personally, and I appreciate the the joking and the ribbing that we've had um, over the over the years, and I will certainly miss you. Okay. Thank you. That's very kind. Is there anything you'd like to say, Dag? This is your, your this is your last meeting. I'll, I'll give you the floor if you'd like it. I, I, just that it's been it's been an honor working for this organization, for the board of trustees, you guys, um, your dedication to the profession, to the advancements of the profession, and uh, and to improving my ability to use my video on Zoom. <laughs> I, I appreciate it. It's very kind. Thank you. And thank you very much, Leah. Godspeed to you, Dick. Moving on uh, to our agenda that takes us to the consent calendar. Is there any member of the Board of Trustees who uh, has a question or needs to pull any item on our consent calendar? Seeing none, we may have a motion to approve as that is presented. It's Jose, I'll make the motion. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Second. Uh, Trustee Cisneros with a motion and Trustee Chen with a second. Nice try, Arnie. Uh, may we have a vote, please? Uh, Broughton? Yes. Chen? Yes. 
Cisneros? Aye. De La Cruz? Delenn? Ganong? Yes. Saleg? Yes. Shelby? Aye. Sol? Aye. Stallings? Yes. Tony? Aye. The motion carries. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Secretary. That takes us to item 701, the approval of amendments to the retiree health plan for retirees of the state bar. And I show uh, Mr. Mazur as our intended presenter. I don't see him on the screen, however. He should be joining shortly. Great, thank you. There he is. If you look really closely, you can see him on the Golden Gate Bridge. Sorry. <laughs> Good morning, trustees. Good morning, Steve. Uh, this item requests board approval to amend the state bar's retiree health plan. Under the current plan, uh, a retiree is eligible for the full health insurance benefit, meaning 80% of the premium paid by the state bar after reaching 15 years of CalPERS service credit, which can be earned during employment with the state bar or previously with any other CalPERS agency. The proposed amendment is to expand the 15 year service requirement to include to recognize in addition to service with a CalPERS agency service earned in one of the 40 other California public agency retirement systems that have established reciprocal service agreements with CalPERS. As I've noted in the agenda item memo for retiree health care employees of CalPERS reciprocal public agencies who are considering employment with the bar face the prospect of losing the retiree benefits they have already earned at their current organization and would then have to wait 15 years to earn comparable benefits at the bar. This creates a significant disincentive for them to come to work at the state bar. So we believe that expanding the eligibility criteria in the way that we are proposing will provide an additional important tool in recruiting highly qualified and experienced candidates for employment at the state bar. Everything is explained in uh, great detail in the agenda item memo, so I'll stop here for uh, questions and discussion. If any. Thank you, Mr. Mazur. Any questions on this item, trustees? Any debate or discussion? Seeing none, may I have a motion. So say I'll move approval. Is there a second? Shelby, I'll second. Thank you both. May we have the roll? Rotten? Yes. Chen? Yes. Cisneros? Aye. De La Cruz? Delenn? Ganong? Yes. Saleg? Yes. Shelby? Aye. Sol? Aye. Stallings? Yes. Tony? Aye. The motion carries. Thank you, Madam Secretary. Item 702 is the approval of the State Bar Final 2022 budget. Um, May we have um, Montoya Chico, please. Looks like we're waiting for her to get in. I think she should be joining. Oh, there she is. There she is. Good morning, Hanaseli. Good morning, board members. So Today, I will be presenting for you the 2022 final budget. So I will be sharing my screen to share my presentation. So please let me know once you see it. There it is. Okay, can everyone see it? Yes. Okay, great. So as I mentioned today, I'll be presenting to you our final 2022 budget that was previously presented to the finance committee last week. So our budget will, I'll, I'll start with a brief budget overview. Um, this budget does highlight some of the key strategic initiatives that Leah has presented uh, at the January board meeting um, that will uh, likely be incorporated as part of the strategic uh, plan once what's adopted. And these uh, strategic initiatives do circle around transparency, accountability, and consumer protection to name a few. Now included, uh, included in our budget uh, in terms of strategic initiatives is investments in IT, and this will uh, support our, our continued migration from our legacy systems and uh, move away from uh, more automated or move into more uh, automated processes. 
Um, the budget also includes seed funding for the client trust account protection program. Um, in addition to also uh, funding to establish the new office of, of the consumer advocate. Now this office <clears throat> will be tasked with acting as an independent and confidential resource to ensure that the complaints uh, that, that arise uh, from the state bar staff or actions do receive a full and impartial review. Um, in addition, we, we funded uh, 10 new positions in the, our Office of Chief Trial Counsel. Um, those 10 new positions in OCTC uh, will increase the capacity to conduct more complex investigations, as well as support more timely processing from cases that are arise from criminal convictions. Now here's a summary of our uh, bar-wide budget. Uh, you see the 2022 budgeted uh, revenues and expenses also in comparison to our 2021 budget and 2021 projected actuals. As you can see for 2022, uh, we do have expenses exceeding revenues by about $12.5 million. So we will balance the budget or the budget will be balanced uh, by a plan use of reserves of that amount. Now, in terms of the majority of the variance uh, between our revenues uh, and expenditures, on the revenue side, it's really primarily due to grants. Uh, we are expecting uh, to receive the new Homeless Prevention Free Grant, uh, and that's also in addition to the ongoing but larger equity access and partnership grants. Um, outside of uh, grants for revenues, a couple items to highlight is that bar exam fees are budgeted to decline, uh, and that's due to, to less number of test takers that we're uh, anticipating, as well as the refunds that we do need to issue for uh, the technology issues we had in the July 2021 bar exam. Um, and you also see a lower in investment earnings, and that's really just a result of our aligning our 2021 budgeted rates closer to our 2021 actuals, which were lower than we had um, budgeted for 2021, uh, thereby reducing our investment earnings. Now, on the expense side for bar-wide expenses, <clears throat> there, there's uh, budgeted to increase and that's similar to the revenue, grant expenditures will also uh, increase as a result of higher uh, grant revenues. Outside of grants, however, expenditures, there's two main drivers uh, of the increase in expenses, one being higher service expenses for IT and the Office of Admissions, and the second is higher debt-related expenses, um, as we are now budgeting both the principal and interest on our debt, and this was done to better align with the use of working capital. <clears throat> Now here's, uh, this slide presents our overview of all of our fund balances. Uh, you will see all of the budgeted revenues and expenses for all of the funds. Now you see that the reserve level for um, three of these funds is below 17%, which is the floor of our reserve policy. Um, and I will discuss in more detail these three funds, the general fund, the admissions fund, and the elimination of bias funds, as these are uh, budgeted to have a deficit before uh, any use of uh, reserves. So first off, here's our detailed uh, general fund budget that shows all of our <clears throat> expense, uh, revenue and expense categories. You'll see that in 2022, we are uh, budgeting expenses to increase revenues by about four, close to $4 million. Um, so we will have to use, have planned user reserves for that amount and it'll bring our ending reserves to about $14 million in the general fund. Um, so our net change, uh, it is projecting to increase uh, from the 2021 budget and definitely from the 2021 actuals. Um, as you will see, our 2021 actuals resulted in a surplus, and that's really mainly attributed to our personal expense savings as our vacancy rates were higher than we had budgeted. Now, in terms of, of the projected revenues or the budgeted revenues for 2022, uh, they are slated to decrease slightly from our 2021 budget. And that's really mainly driven by a reduction in investment earnings that is being offset by an increase in a higher tenant lease uh, revenue as uh, more tenants are starting to return back into the office. On the expense side, you will see that our budgeted expenses in the general fund are, are, are budgeted to increase both from the 2021 budget and the 2021 actuals. And that's mainly driven by two factors. One is the debt related um, increase that I previously mentioned. We're budgeting now both principal and interest, whereas in prior years, we had only budgeted uh, the interest portion. And this change we made is to better align uh, 
or illustrate the use of working capital and reduce the large discrepancies that we were seeing in, in our budget versus actual in our um, quarterly financial statements. The second factor uh, is the increase uh, in, in service expenses that is primarily driven by that investment that we are making in IT, in IT expenditures. Um, so the, that excess of expenses over revenues does require us to have a, a close to $4 million use of reserves uh, in 2022. So next is the admissions, uh, the admissions budget. Here's uh, our detailed admissions budget. And as you can see, we are projecting uh, expenses to exceed revenues by almost $9 million. Um, and that net change is increasing from our 2021 budget and also our 2021 actuals. Now, in terms of admissions revenues, um, revenues are expected or, or budgeted to decrease um, due to the projected decline in number of test takers, as well as those refunds that we need to issue for the July bar exam. Um, on the expense side, it, it's a net increase of about $700,000. And that's really driven by an increase in service expenses that is being offset by a decrease in exam related expenses. Now this uh, increase and decrease in these two expense categories is really all related to the service agreement um, to outsource our, our in-person bar exam uh, sites and procurement uh, and proctoring services. Now, prior to any use of uh, reserves, Admissions fund has about a $9 million deficit. Um, I will say though that in 2020 and 2021, um, these budgets did reflect a deficit. However, actual results yielded surpluses. So it's not unreasonable to assume that our 8.8 or close to $9 million deficit will be less uh, than what we're currently budgeting. Um, now out of that entire night, about $9 million deficit, only a portion is one-time occurrence in 2022. Um, outside of that, we do acknowledge that admissions has a structural deficit, um, and that deficit is not sustainable on an ongoing basis, um, which is why right now we are currently performing an analysis to try to identify what are the causes of the deficit, as well as what are some possible mitigating measures. Um, and we do have, we do plan to complete this analysis and present it to the board um, at, the May, at, the May, uh, at the May meeting. The next fund, the Elimination of Bias Fund, here's uh, the, the detailed um, budget for the Elimination of Bias Fund. And as you can see, we are projecting or budgeting our expenses to exceed revenues by almost $400,000. And that is also increasing from both 2021 budget and 2021 actuals. Um, now for this slide, I'm gonna pass it back to Leah briefly to share more um, history and information on the elimination of bias fund. Okay, and just again to recap why we're focusing on these particular funds um, going in depth is these are the funds where the reserve balance will be below uh, the board adopted reserve minimum of 17% of the end of 2022. So with elimination of bias, this is a, a, a fund, it's an opt out fee, but it is a voluntary fee that uh, licensees pay. It is at $2 per licensee. Uh, that reflects a reduction from $5 uh, and that $5 level existed pre separation of the state bar sections. So obviously when you go from $5 to $2, you do experience a very significant decline in revenue. At the same time, that that revenue source has decreased, our work on diversity, equity, and inclusion has increased. So we've got kind of an, in, uh, an inverse relationship there. Uh, one of the ways it's increased is that we now are required to submit a biannual uh, report to the legislature on our DEI work, on our plan for increasing diversity in the profession and the results of those efforts. We have also, and as part of that plan, adopted an approach internally uh, that I like to call built in, not bolted on. And this means that our DEI work manifests in all aspects of our operations. And you all have heard a, a lot about this, particularly in the discipline arena uh, with our work to assess uh, racial disparities in the discipline system. We've done a tremendous amount of work on the admissions side as well. 
and in other areas of our organization. So the work is expanding, the revenue has uh, shrunk. So it's clear here that the revenue stream uh, to support this work is insufficient. In our 2021 uh, report submitted to the legislature, we outlined a revenue need of more than 400,000 in addition to that received through voluntary donations. Uh, we have not um, yet been successful in securing those revenues. The good news is that this work can be funded by our general fund. Uh, it's fully aligned with our mission. Uh, again, our mission indicates that we are responsible for increasing the diversity of the profession. So we are able to sustain the work using our general fund, uh, but this is, is in fact a structural deficit that I don't have, we don't have a quick fix for other than to have the general fund support this work. Thanks, Aristotle. Okay, so continuing uh, here, you, you, I shared this slide earlier in my presentation and I'm presenting it here again to once again show our overall projected position for all of the funds. Um, I discussed those at the general fund admissions fund and elimination of bias funds that um, are below the 17% floor of the reserve policy. All of the funds that you see here as NA, these are mostly grant related funds that are excluded from the minimum reserve target. Um, the three funds that you see are uh, above 30%. 30% is, is the ceiling of our reserve, uh, our reserve policy. Um, and any fund that has uh, the reserve, reserve level above 30% does require a spend down plan, which we do plan to uh, present to you at the, bay, at the main board meeting. Now, the, the lawyer's assistant program, um, to, to talk about this one briefly, um, this one, we do have authority to transfer excess funds into the client security fund. However, right now, we are not planning on making any transfers. Uh, we do want to make investments in preventative education, so we need to assess how much of those excess funds we can use uh, for that investment. Um, but we do anticipate to be able to transfer um, up to uh, approximately $250,000 um, as part of the spend down plan uh, from LAP into CSF. Now, CSF uh, is, a, is a somewhat unique fund. So the client security fund is, is essentially made up of two portions. One is the application payouts portion and the other is the administrative portion of the fund. Um, now the reserve policy does exclude the payout and administrative portion. Um, However, there is no policy that stipulates uh, how the reserve should be allocated between the payouts and the administrative portion. So in our, in our 2022 budget, all of our reserves are currently being budgeted in the payouts portion. Um, this is a fund that, I, that we do need to have further discussions on. Um, and in a future committee meeting, uh, we, we do want to discuss this overall policy and, and propose a formal amendment to consider excluding CSF altogether from the reserve policy, similar to how we have uh, our grant-related funds excluded. Um, here's a summary of the board reserve policy, which states that you know, all funds, uh, the fund and reserve balances should be between 17 and 30% uh, outside of the grant-related funds. Uh, those that do, uh, that do have a, a reserve greater than 30% for six months or more uh, do require a spend down plan to be presented. Um, and the reserve policy also has uh, conditions uh, where it is appropriate for the reserves to fall below the minimum target. Um, and these conditions are listed here. One of them being one-time use for investments in human resources, technology, or other improvements if they will strengthen uh, the state gross revenues or reduce future costs. Um, in terms of, of that exception or that, of that policy condition, um, Recall that the general fund does have a projected deficit prior to use of any, any plan reserves. Um, there's two main drivers of that deficit, one being uh, the investments in IT, which we are, we are making one-time investments in 2022 for IT services and equipment. Um, this will help facilitate the transition from uh, manual to more automated processes, thus reducing our costs on a long-term basis. And the second driver of the general fund deficit is that debt related uh, change uh, we made. However, with the planned use of our San Francisco, or with the planned sale, excuse me, of our San Francisco building this year, um, a lot of that outstanding debt will be eliminated. So this aspect of deficit is also limited in nature. 
Um, and we believe that the general fund deficit uh, for these reasons does satisfy uh, that condition uh, or that exception. Um, now the other two funds I spoke about, one, the elimination of bias fund, that one is uh, projected to have a balance of 5.6%. And we don't believe that the deficit is supported by one of the minimum target exceptions that I've discussed. Um, and as Leah mentioned, any future activities in this fund will need to be funded uh, from the general fund. And a similar case is uh, for admissions, they have a projected reserve balance of 14%. Um, and they do have that ongoing structural uh, deficit that we don't believe is supported by the minimum reserve target exception either, um, which is why we are performing that analysis to identify uh, the causes of the deficit and some possible mitigating measures. So, that concludes my presentation and I will open up the floor, see if anybody has any questions. Um, if not, have Lisa put up the resolution. Thank you, Ms. Montoya Chico. Are any questions um, from the trustees? Mr. Tony. Yeah, <clears throat> excuse me. I, I wanted to thank um, uh, Araceli for her work. Um, and I'm very pleased with um, the, uh, the proposal and um, the extra work put into it. That's my only comment. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. Trustee Shelby. I, um, oh, here we go. I, I too wanted to, um, you know, I am not a finance person and I don't sit on finance committee. And so the ease of which these documents were put together for lay people. And initially I planned on coming to finance committee because I wanted to be really prepared in terms of making the decision today and found that as I prepared myself, there was no need because it was so clear and so thorough. And so I just wanna say thank you to Araceli and her team in terms of the clarity um, and just appreciate that and look forward to adding my support in terms of this budget moving forward. So thank you. Thank you, thank you Trustee Shelby. Speaking of the Finance Committee, Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. As, uh, <clears throat> as, uh, as Chair of the Finance Committee, I, I also just wanna echo uh, the, uh, the comments of my, uh, my fellow board members about uh, uh, the work that uh, our chief financial officer and her team put into uh, to this agenda item. I think uh, the, the agenda item uh, based on her presentation sort of clearly shows uh, the fiscal situation that the board uh, finds itself in for 2022. Uh, from a revenue standpoint, from an expenditure standpoint, from a, a fund balance standpoint, and also from the, a use of, of reserve standpoint. Uh, and I think here's uh, my takeaway. Uh, we have some funds that are uh, in deficit. We have some funds that have reserves. Uh, we have, uh, we've had to use reserves in order to, uh, to, uh, to get into balance. And we have some funds that going forward are gonna need uh, some, some spend down plans. Um, so that says to me as a, as, a, as a chair of the finance committee uh, and working with uh, our CFO uh, and with my fellow finance committee members, uh, we have some work ahead of us in order to ensure that our fiscal house uh, remains in order going forward. Uh, but with that being said, we are in balance and I would be prepared to, uh, uh, to make a motion to, uh, to, to move this item. Although when I look at the resolution, I'm not exactly, oh, okay, this is the right one. All right, very good. <clears throat> okay, the resolution is on the board. It sounds like uh, Mr. Trustee Sowell has moved it. Is that correct, Arnie? Yes, please. Is there a second on the resolution? This is Christine, I second. Thank you, Trustee Ganong. Any discussion? Any further discussion or questions? Seeing none, then we have the roll. Broughton? Yes. Chen? Yes. Cisneros? Aye. De La Cruz? Delen? Ganong? Yes. Salag? Yes. Shelby? Aye. Seoul? Aye. Stallings? Yes. Tony? Aye. The motion carries. Thank you, Madam Secretary. Thank you, uh, uh, trustees and staff, for as as uh, many folks have said, the very clear um, information you've given us and a clear path on, on the budget. So, good work. Look forward to what comes next.
For the immediate, what comes next is item 703, which is the board's response to communications with the legislature about closing the justice gap working group and regulatory reform. Uh, Ms. Herskowitz and Ms. Grammy are listed here as staff. I don't know who's going first, but um, the floor is yours. Uh, Bridget Grammy will be speaking first. Sorry about that. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Bridget Grabby. I'm the uh, Deputy Chief of Programs here at the bar. And I just wanted to present this item on staff's recommendations for moving forward with the Closing the Justice Gap Working Group in light of the you know, addressing the concerns that we received in the December 7th letter from the chairs of the Judiciary Committees in the legislature. Um, as you probably know from reading our memo, after receiving the letter, we canceled the previously scheduled working group meetings um, from December through February so that staff could further address some of the issues and concerns that we've heard and make some recommendations to the board. Uh, so before I get into those, uh, summarizing those recommendations, I did just wanna take a minute to thank all of the members of the working group and of staff for putting in a lot of time on this issue. Um, we detailed all of the work that they've done so far in our memo, um, but and, and particularly Justice uh, Allison Tucker, who's been the chair of the working group and all of her leadership, in all of this, it's been a lot of work. And so I do wanna take a moment to recognize that. Um, so just to summarize what we've been doing, we've, we've heard from a lot of stakeholders over the last couple of months, and we've put together the recommendations that you have before you in, in the memo uh, to try to address these concerns. So I just wanted to briefly summarize them for you. Uh, the first one is to address the concern that we've heard that there are members of the working group who are from outside of California and who lacks California specific um, experience. And so to address that concern, we are recommending today that the working group's composition be changed and that the board would think and excuse those members who live and work outside of California um, who lack the California specific experience. So we, we are really grateful to these individuals. They worked really hard and provided some very important perspective for us, but we are also sensitive to the concerns that we've heard. Um, to address the concern that the bar is diverting too many resources uh, into this working group, we are recommending that the that the working group um, meetings be streamlined. That we, for for now anyway, eliminate the subcommittees and reduce the amount of staff time that is devoted to uh, staffing all these public meetings. And then we would work with the chair to uh, streamline the way that the meetings are going forward so that we can maximize the. Uh, productivity of the full working group meetings on a monthly basis. And then finally, we're recommending some specific changes to the charter. And we would work with the chair and come back to the board in, in March, if this is what you direct us to do, um, to address some of the more specific concerns that we've heard, such as the roles of the legislature and the, and the Supreme Court in authorizing or the parameters um, for what types of entities might be admitted into the sandbox and also for how to, you know, waiving or exempting certain existing statutes or rules. So we would recommend that um, the charter be amended to more specifically direct the working group to come up with recommendations on that. And also recommendations on screening and monitoring procedures to address these concerns that we're hearing. And you've heard some today about the, um, possible possibility for undue influence or compromise of professional judgment for um, you know, non-lawyer ownership entities. So specific recommendations from the working group on how to screen and monitor and address these, this potential issue. Um, we're also recommending that the charter be amended to relieve the working group of additional ancillary rule assignments. Um, that would include looking at the advertising rules and the lawyer referral service rules. Um, so that they could really focus on the sandbox related recommendations and also to extend the deadline so that it's, there's not a perception that we're trying to rush this process, but that the working group really has the time uh, to work through all of the recommendations that they're making to the board. So I'm happy to answer any questions that any of you have about this, but I did wanna turn it over to Donna Hershkowitz who can address some additional concerns that she's heard from stakeholders after we posted our recommendations. Thank you, Bridget. Um, I did have the opportunity since the agenda was posted to have a few conversations with a representative who was speaking on behalf of um, 
some who have expressed concerns about the composition and the direction of the working group. Um, I think the public commenters that you all have heard today have largely expressed these points for the board's consideration, but I did commit that I would personally share that message, and so I want to go ahead and do so. Um, the, again, this is um, uh, representative of those who expressed concerns about the composition uh, and direction of the group. Um, they believe strongly that eliminating from the working group um, those without significant Cal California experience simply does not go far enough. Um, they believe that even with the elimination of those individuals, the working group has a bias um, toward a particular outcome and that the organized bar simply doesn't have a sufficient voice on the, um, on the working group to bring to bear um, all of the, the knowledge that they have um, to help shape the direction of, of the outcome here. Um, they believe that, the, that a better approach um, than what has been suggested by uh, the staff memo is to thank and excuse the entire working group, um, to take a pause, um, not to necessarily end the work on this. Um, uh, frankly, the recommendation is that that you know staff can can work something up and work through the legislative process, but that if the board feels that it is necessary or appropriate to have a working group develop recommendations, then after the after a pause, the board may choose to reappoint some of the existing working group members um, or not. Um, but that, um, uh, but just uh, starting again with a, a slightly smaller composition of the group is not sufficient as the current makeup of the group, um, they believe is not conducive to a collaborative uh, environment going forward. Um, and, and also, as you heard, sort of suggesting that, uh, that part of what we would do during such a pause would be to gather some evidence about what is going on on the ground. Um, they uh, that also uh, argued that a number that the fact that a number of member members of the working group submitted a response um, to the chairs of the assembly and senate judiciary committees um, creates an unworkable situation um, with some of the members of the working group those who, who signed the letter having staked out um, their positions um, and again would not be conducive to a collaborative environment going forward and that that um, it going forward with the group as currently constituted, even without those without California significant experience, could result in, in other members of the group um, reconsidering their participation if they feel that the group is biased toward a particular outcome. Um, and so I just wanted to, as I said, sort of um, uh, carry through with my commitment to present that information to make sure the board uh, heard that and considered it as part of their deliberations. Thank you, Ms. Hershkowitz. Thank you, Ms. Grammy. Um, let me just look to Ms. Wilson to see if, if that is the end of the staff report before uh, I open it up to the board. I believe so. Okay. Thank you. Thank you both. And thank you all. Um, certainly there uh, is a lot that we have heard um, and read. Uh, so I'm not going to get into uh, my comments yet. I'd like the board to um, start this off as I'm looking for hands. I see Mr. Tony. We'll start with Trustee Tony, please. Um, I'd like to start, <clears throat> excuse me. I'd like to start by asking a couple of questions. One is um, the out-of-state board members, <clears throat> were they appointed to the committee at the beginning of the process or were they appointed, late, did they join at a later point? I, I don't know, I wasn't around. Um, the, the, this committee was, um, and paneled before I joined the uh, Board of Trustees. Yes, they were, they were appointed from the beginning um, and as part of an overall direction from the, from the board with, with respect to certain experts that the board wanted to have on the committee. So we wanted, uh, or the recommendation from the board was, you know, somebody who has expertise in, in regulating these issues. So one of the, one of the out-of-state members um, is a is a former regulator in the United Kingdom that did a, a worked on a similar project, um, you know. So anyway, they were fulfilling kind of specific slots that the board had uh, had directed in the composition. From the thank thank you. <clears throat> You're answering my follow up question, which is that um, it was known at the time 
that they lived out of state. This was not a new revelation that came after the fact, correct? Yeah. Okay, thank you. And, and Mr. Tony, I would I would add that you know one of the one of the specific <clears throat> areas of um, <clears throat> membership composition included um, included someone who had experience with the Utah Sandbox um, because they are um, because they they are some you know a year or so ahead of of where California is on that, and so the the thinking was that there would be some value in bringing. Um, to bear some of the knowledge that that the that they had gained in Utah. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Tony. Um, while I'm waiting for other hands, I will just point out that 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 uh, phenomenon of um, seeking out and including voices from other jurisdictions is uh, not uncommon to the bar, at least in my experience. For example, um, several years ago, the Malpractice Insurance Working Group. Uh, was put together um, at the request of the legislature, actually, um, and included several out-of-state um, experts um, to who provided valuable input to the working group. I was a part of that working group, um, and so it certainly um, did provide for more robust uh, discussion and um, the chance to look at what other jurisdictions were doing, uh, both successfully and maybe without success. So I'm assuming that that was uh, the intent here, and it's certainly not uncommon in my experience at the state bar. See a bunch of nodding heads, so that's good. Um, Justice Shelby, please. Yes, and this question is, it is for either uh, Bridget or for Donna. Good morning. If um, if the composition of the working group was not adjusted, how would that impact the revision to the charter? It would not. Okay. Um, so yes, we could. We could. If, if the board chose not to direct a revision to the composition, we could carry forward with the other recommendations um, that are included here without that change. Um, the board could also um, um, uh, direct that the that those out of state members um, become, you know, non-voting advisors. So we could have their expertise, but they they wouldn't have a vote. There are a variety of options, but that is not, um, the other recommendations are not contingent upon the composition. Okay. That's helpful. And then in relation to just kind of past history, cause like Mr. Tony, I was not a part of this dais, um, when this group was constituted, has there ever been anything similar to this with any of the other, um, committees in relation to, you know, where we find ourselves, where, where there's recommendation to kind of change midstream. I'm probably, I'm trying, trying to figure that out because I'm trying to see where we are from a precedence setting standpoint. I certainly appreciate all of the, I've had an opportunity to chat with people. I've appreciated all the outreach and the conversation, but I guess one of my primary concerns is if we begin to change things midstream now, do we set up a precedence where we do this moving forward? Has this been done in the past? And so I would love to know if that, I would love to get that history if possible. Thank you. I can't think of a, of a scenario where that has been done in the past, though, um, though it feels to me like our, um, like the this adoption of sort of of ad hoc committees, not you know not having standing committees is is fairly new, and so um, and so we you know we've ha we had the committee of bar examiners and the the council on access and fairness, and so no there has not been sort of that that um, uh, reevaluation of the members of those committees, um, but I can't I can't think of anything else. But Leah looked like she was about to say something, so she might yeah. Have to I would. It's not exactly the same situation, but when we did the appendix I work, which uh, we bring up um, many times, our work to look at you know the bar sub entities. There was a lot of concern about the process with respect to the legal services trust fund commission and our access work generally, and so we were asked and directed to kind of change the process and establish a stakeholder working group to take on some of the issues. I think it was actually related to both the Access Commission and the Legal Services Trust Fund Commission. So that was um, the only thing that came to mind where we had one process underway, there was a lot of concern expressed. And so we changed the process mid course, not exactly parallel 
uh, but something somewhat similar that came to mind. Perfect. And then last but certainly not least, um, the, the working group is going to be putting, they're tasked with putting together recommendations that the board will or will not adopt, correct? And so their work is not set in stone. And so once they come up with recommendations, those would be advanced to the board and the board at that point in time makes a decision. I just wanted to be clear on that. Correct. Yeah, okay. that's right. Perfect. Thank you. And, and I do feel, I, I wasn't around, but Appendix I, I feel like I've memorized it. So thank you for that, um, for that reference. Thank you, Trustee Shelby. I see Vice Chair Stallings has his hand up. All right, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm sorry, I'm having bandwidth issues here, so my camera is off. Um, yeah, I just wanted to support what Leah said about Appendix I and just how we, I think we're, we're fairly responsive to issues that came up. And so to Trustee Shelby's concerns, I think this board has always tried to, um, to display that flexibility and to, um, you know, to really maybe not have that set in stone policy as far as these these groups are formed and to in some some instances um, switch uh, switch direction if that is what's going to be best for um, for the ultimate goals. Thank you, Brandon. Trustee Sowell. I too like uh, uh, my fellow board members uh, Tony and Shelby was not around when this, uh, uh, this group was constituted or took, took the vote to, uh, to do that. But uh, I've tried to um, uh, really kind of wrestled with this item quite a, quite a bit, trying to understand its, its history, its sort of implications and uh, sort of what's before us today. And, uh, and obviously in, in listening to the public testimony and, and doing some of that due diligence, uh, there, there are a couple of things that, that, that strike me that uh, I, I have a couple of questions. Uh, one is um, we heard today and we've heard previously uh, about the need for fund, additional funding for proven uh, sort of programs, uh, other sort of legal aid programs, uh, et cetera, uh, to expand the system. Um, is there uh, in the governor's budget at this particular point in time uh, some uh, additional funding that may be headed that way? Or uh, have we had discussions with stakeholders about what such a proposal potentially could look like? Um, I am actually in communication with the Department of Finance um, and I've been working very closely with the Legal Aid Association of California and the California Access Commission to identify um, uh, additional funding needs um, for uh, housing related legal services um, to put together a clear methodology so we could with confidence identify a number for the Department of Finance um, for in hopes of putting additional funding in the budget. Um, so that's that's something that's actually going on right now. I actually need to need to finalize an email today, um, but I've been having those communications and it's certainly something that we've been involved in um, um, in, in past years. We're also you know in working on you know funding for um, for a loan repayment assistance program to increase, um, recruitment and retention for legal aid providers. Um, so there, there are quite a number of things um, that we are doing otherwise on the access front um, uh, outside of the regulatory reform efforts that we are um, that we are looking at. I think Arnie in, in both last year's budget and this year's, um, including I think when RSLE went over that significant revenue increase in 2022, there is more grant money. So I think some of that may be federal. I'm not quite certain, but we certainly have seen increases in state funding in this area as well. Uh, um, but, but I also want to make the point that the populations uh, that are intended to be served generally by the regulatory reform efforts that we've been talking about, be it today, the sandbox, other days, the paraprofessional program are often the missing middle. So folks who do not qualify for free legal services uh, provided through legal services organizations that cannot afford to hire a lawyer. So I also wanna clarify that there are different populations in this state that manifest need. Um, and so when we talk about increasing funding for free legal services, um, you know, there's, there's a whole population, millions of Californians that are really never going to be eligible for free legal services. Got it. 
my uh, I appreciate that. And so my and I appreciate the work that that uh, the team is doing in that uh, in that area. Thank you, Donna. Uh, my second question just has to do with staff time, and in the item itself, it talks about the the, the amount of staff time that's been uh, been dedicated to this and the changes that are going to going to now uh, be made. Um, uh, I guess eliminating uh, subcommittees and, and those sorts of things like that should reduce uh, that amount of staff time. The item itself doesn't necessarily sort of speak to how, you know, what that balance or what that change actually might be. So, cause, so, cause, so could someone at least just sort of speak a little bit to uh, what we see going forward from, a, from the, the, the vantage point of, of how much staff time this is going to require. Sure, I can I can start with that. So yes, with having the subcommittees, the way that it had been working in the past is we were having three public member public meetings a month on this particular working group, which did just generate a lot of staff time with, you know, having the um, the Zoom meetings and staffing those and making sure we're publishing the materials and the agenda and all those things in time and um, which so one of the our recommendations as far as reducing the staff time is just to reduce it to one meeting a month, the full meeting. I think that in itself will reduce the amount of time spent on it. And then we're also going to reduce the number of staff that have that have been attending the meetings and working on that. And I don't have the specifics for you as to, you know, all of the numbers, but we are cognizant of the fact that a significant number of staff had been attending um, and dedicating time to this. And so we are working on a, on a new plan to reduce those numbers. Last, go ahead, go ahead. I'm sorry, yeah, Trustee Sowell, let me just um, ask a follow-up into that that specific question, and then if you could ask your next question after this. I, I wanna make sure that we're distinguished. Well, my sense is there's a distinction between staff time at the bar um, from the Office of the Chief Trial Counsel and staff time of non-OCTC staff. Could you talk to us a little bit about that? Yes, thank you for that. So the, the majority of the staff that that is um, staffing this committee is from the Office of Professional Competence. We do we have had one representative from the Office of Chief Trial Counsel attending the meetings just to be there in case there were issues that come up with discipline related things. But we can work on that particular whether we need to have that person at every meeting or whether there's a different way to do that. Um, but the the staff who are working on this are those that work on the rules of professional conduct on you know on um, ethics opinions they're really more the ethics experts that have been working on these issues so they're not the same people that are investigating cases for the office of chief trial counsel thank you okay arnie go ahead uh, last point is I, I think many of you know uh i spent 20 plus years in the in the in the legislature as a staffer in the, in the speaker's office and uh, many of the uh, sort of the the arguments, both for and against, I are reminiscent of uh, sort of the fights on a uh, medical scope of practice issues uh, on bills over over many many years, and so um, I just want to make sure. I, I think this is just a question that uh, uh, Trustee Shelby just asked, but um, a vote to move this item forward today is a vote to continue the, the exploratory sort of due diligence that the board needs to do uh, in order to. Um, uh, make a decision and that decision would then subsequently uh, come back to us in the form of another agenda item and uh, sort of I guess a final report so to speak. Yes, that's right. Thank you. Yeah, and and if I could be clear, Trustee Sowell, um, the, um, I mean you characterize that exactly correctly, right? The working group is sort of doing the exploratory work to develop recommendations for the board's consideration um, recommendations that may then subsequently go out for public comment, come back for board consideration. Um, that would go to the Supreme Court um, for for their approval. And um, and as we've been clear from from the beginning, and I think there's been some some concern that the that there was an intention to um, to sort of adopt uh, adopt changes without going to the legislature. And this board has been very clear from the beginning that we would we would absolutely have to bring this through the legislative process as well, um, and um, and this is right. This is this is the process. This exploratory process is is part of how the board determines what what it thinks, if anything, should move forward to these other um, oversight bodies um, that we work with, the Supreme Court and the legislature. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee Sowell. Thank you, uh, Donna and Bridget, for the answers.
Any other questions from the trustees on the staff report on um, the material that we've been presented? By the way, thank you very much for the very thorough and easy to follow staff report. Sequentially, the, the way it all laid out made, made a lot of sense to me. It was really interesting to see uh, the, um, the calendar of meetings and who presented what and to be able to click on a link and see the YouTube of that meeting. I certainly wish I had enough time to see them all. Um, but that's very, very valuable input to the board. And so I appreciate that. Thank you. Okay, if there are no further questions, here's what I would propose that we do. We've been going for um, coming up on an hour and 45 minutes. Uh, I'm hoping that the information that uh, the trustees have heard um, both in public comment and the staff report is going to um, engender some discussion from us. Um, I am mindful of the time and my hunger. Um, so <laughs> I'm gonna suggest that uh, maybe we take a 30 minute break here, go grab something to eat um, and then come back ready to have, have a discussion. I, I certainly do uh, uh, you know, understand that there are folks who are watching, uh, but this will give them a chance maybe to get to their, their inboxes as well. Um, because I really would like to, to hear the board's perspective on this uh, very important issue. Does that sound like a plan for folks? I see some nodding hands and a thumbs up at least. So that would take us to 12.15. Um, um, let, me, let me just double check something. Um, I'm assuming that there's going to be debate and discussion. Uh, if there is not going to be a lot of debate and discussion, then we can just we can do that here and take a vote. Um, so let me just take the temperature. Do folks think that we are ready to hear a motion um, on the resolution as presented? Will there be more than 15 minutes of discussion? Mr. Chair, um, I have held off on my discussion points um, during the question period, but I certainly have um put a lot of thought and would appreciate the opportunity to have a full um discussion about this okay thank you trustee tony um i, I will also suggest that if there are going to be any changes to the resolutions um or the intended motion as staff has been presented to us we probably should sort of make those clear and talk about them um so let's go ahead and take the 30 minutes to eat let's reconvene at 12 15 we will have um, some, discate, some discussion and some debate um, and then move on with the rest of our calendar. So thank you so much. We'll see you back here uh, sharply at 1215.
We are now recording. And Chair Duran, I'd like to note for the record that uh, Trustee De La Cruz is here now. Great, thank you. Welcome, Trustee De La Cruz. We look forward to uh, having you participate in the rest of the meeting. Thank you everyone for um, uh, allowing us to take a quick break for lunch. I see that we still have uh, folks from the public uh, observing and so I appreciate your continued interest. Uh, where we left off was uh, the trustees had the opportunity to ask questions of staff on the uh, closing the justice gap working group item uh, after a very uh, thorough staff presentation. Thank you, Ms. Hershkowitz. Thank you, Ms. Grammy. Um, and my intention and, and thought was that uh, we would pick up after lunch with um, some debate uh, or, and or a motion. Before we get there, um, I didn't wanna take the opportunity to uh, personally and publicly thank again, Justice Tuker um, and the, uh, the vice, the co-vice chairs of the committees whose names are no longer on my screen. This is great, I apologize. Um, if I could have your assistance, Ms. Grammy, I'm so appreciative. Mary Baldwin and Rebecca Sandifer. Thank you so much. Um, along with all the members of the working group uh, committee, I, as our staff report shows, um, there have been many, many hours of serious hard work and deep thought, I think, into um, these, these important issues on access to justice. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, clearly there is um, plenty of interest and concern from um, attorneys and non-attorneys in the state. And so uh, if nothing else, I think that this uh, process where we find ourselves now um, is a good example of what uh, an entity like the State Bar um, is specially charged and uniquely situated to do, which is service to the public at the same time, while at the same time, um, while at the same time, of course, um, doing the best we can with our statutory mandate to uh, regulate uh, the, the profession and admit new lawyers into the profession. So this um, other piece of it, I think, is an important, uh, an important aspect. Um, I also want to uh, take a, a second to, to thank um, Chairman Umberg and Chairman Stone for uh, for reaching out and for essentially starting um, or continuing this discussion with their letter and, and um, engaging in conversations with me and, and um, taking my our, our letter in response um, and and really for what is clear to me is you know their concern for um, for the protection of the public which of course which is we're, what we're all here to do um, and I think how we get there is is you know, part of this process here. So um, as I told them, I thought that it was important um, to bring the their concerns and their issues to the board. I certainly don't have the authority acting alone as the chair um, to stop or start um, any effort like this. And so I do look forward to the chair, excuse me, to the um, trustees um, thoughts and observations. We have a staff report that has uh, recommendations in front of us. Um, I am actually going to start out by um, suggesting that maybe we um, amend that staff recommendation just a little bit because um, as I've expressed to folks throughout this process, uh, it is important to me that the board uh, exhibit leadership in this um, in this endeavor. Uh, it's clear that that the trustees care about this as as evidence from your questions to the staff report conversations that I've had with, with many folks. Um, and so I would like the board to consider as we move forward, if, if the staff's recommendation is what carries the day, that we uh, amend it to add um, a representative from the board of trustees onto the working group, um, either as a voting member or non-voting member, it doesn't necessarily matter too much to me, but I think it would evidence um, that we're that this process is evolving, that the board is um, taking uh, due consideration of it, some ownership and some active participation as I, um, as I expressed to the chairs when I've spoken to them about, about the importance that many of us um, feel these, these issues deserve. So uh, 
I'm tempted to ask for volunteers, but I actually, um, I actually have somebody in mind that I, I think would be a, a very good liaison to this working group from the from the board of trustees. Um, and I'm going to put him on the spot a little bit, uh, Trustee Tony. I'm going to going to ask as we as we as we have this conversation if you would put some thought into perhaps representing the board on the working group. You don't have to give me your answer now, uh, one way or the other, but. I think that your perspective as a member of the public um, and the work that you do in your day-to-day -day life, quite frankly, in the consumer protection area lends itself very well to, um, to the continuation of the working group. So don't, don't feel obligated, but, but certainly um, if there are any other members of the board who would, would uh, like to step up to the, to, the, to the task, I would be appreciative of hearing your perspectives. And that's it. That's what I'll put on the table for now. Uh, Ruben, this is Jose. If I could just make it a, a suggestion. Um, I very much uh, like your idea of putting a board member also on the uh, committee because I think uh, to the point you're trying to make, I think that gives us a lot more contact and engagement. And um, um, I just wonder though, um, one, one board member might feel a little bit burdened to be the one voice I wonder if it might be smart to make it two and maybe uh, one uh, public member of the board and one attorney member of the board might be a good way to go. Um, and of course, uh, again, not adding any pressure, but I also endorse your nomination of Mark Tony, um, an excellent person to take it if you would be so inclined. Uh, that's my comment. Thank you, Trustee Cisneros. Mr. Tony, your hand is up. Well, <clears throat> The first thing I want to do, um, Chair Duran, is to um, thank you for the compliment. And um, I will think about it. That, that's what I can say right now. Um, so, but, but if I, <clears throat> is it appropriate now to make comments on the proposal? Okay, I mean, I, 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 I would actually suggest that it be separate motions, that the adding to the committee and the motion in uh, the staff uh, proposal be separate motions, and I'll explain why. Um, I'm just, um, I have a hard time understanding, and I appreciate the time and thoughtfulness that the staff put into putting together this proposal, but I have a hard time understanding how this proposal um, really um, addresses the fundamental issue of what the legislature expects of the uh, state bar, um, California state bar, particularly. Um, and so, I mean, I read the same letter everybody read, but maybe I read it differently. I read the letter as um, the legislature continues to be frustrated that the state bar has not made sufficient progress on reducing the attorney discipline uh, backlog. That's that's what I read. That's what I read and interpret the letter. I don't believe there is anything we can do in terms of tweaking this working group, closing the justice uh, gap working group, that is going to address that issue. So that's my first point. Um. I, you know, when I, when, when I look at um, and, and listen to, uh, you know, you know, look at this proposal, I see things like, um, you know, streamlining it, uh, less staff time. <clears throat> we don't need a motion from the board for the staff to do that, okay? The staff can do that on their own. Um, I'm, I'm completely confident. Um, screening, monitoring, professional ethics. I am very concerned about those issues, okay? And I cannot imagine that the working group, having heard these concerns over and over again, I have to think they are going to address those in whatever comes to us. Um, I gotta say, I am a huge skeptic of this sandbox, okay? A very huge skeptic for many of the reasons that speakers today have talked about. This whole concept of um, allowing big tech companies to profiteer, okay? 
and to create greater income inequality. Um, I have a hard time understanding how that in the long run is going to improve access to legal advice. Um, however, given that I have skepticism, I also believe in um, the principles of good governance, that any body, governing body, has to have principles of good governance. And one of those is when you set up a committee and you ask people to do work, to bring you a proposal, and they've done the work for over a year, um, 70, 80 hours of meetings, I understand, and work, okay, um, that you don't change it mid-rule. I am very skeptical, but guess what? I want to see the proposal. I want to see the, pro I want to debate this proposal on the merits, okay? <laughs> I still may not like it, but I want to debate it on the merits. It's hard to debate a proposal that's not in writing. That's what I want to do at this point. And hey, at the beginning, if I were here for the discussion, I very well may have voted against setting up this sandbox um, at all. However, I want to respect my prior colleagues. I want to respect the institution of the state bar and sh show that respect by um, uh, letting this working group continue its work, put the proposal on the table, then we can discuss it by its merits. I think that is the fair thing to do, the responsible thing to do. Um, one of the co-chairs that you know the board um, appointed is one of the out-of-state members that you just thanked, Mr. Chair, okay? I'm a little bit like the time to have a debate about the composition of a working group is at the very beginning, okay? If there were issues about out of state, that's the time to bring it up. This was no surprise here. This was deliberate. And I think we need to see it through. That is the responsible thing to do. And so I am going to ask my fellow trustees to consider voting no on this proposal. Voting no on this proposal is the strongest way to support the continuance of the working group and their ability to bring us a proposal, and then we can discuss it, okay? And, um, and I'm not saying this as a supporter. I am not a champion of the sandbox. Gotta make that clear. I have major issues, but I think there is a fairness issue. There's a good governance issue, okay? Um, and, and, and so if they need an extension for time, let the working group come to the board and ask for an extension. We don't need to give them an extension. That's really up to them. They might need it, they can come and ask. But, but I very strongly believe that we should vote no on this proposal and let the working group complete its work under the current circumstances. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee Tony. I see Vice Chair Stallings has his hand up. All right, thank you, Mr. Chair. So. As a board member who was around when we um, created um, these these proposals, uh, I initially was not in favor of certain aspects of them. But I, um, I, I really what really resonated with me was this idea that if we did not take leadership in these areas, uh, then there there was essentially a vacuum that would be created, and that Californians could continue to be hurt as a result of predatory practices that were being employed um, in several different venues, um, and that um, the state bar really needed to show leadership, given that our charge is to uh, increase diversity, to ensure access to justice, um, and really, if we did not try and occupy those fields and at least study the impact of uh, various, various potential reforms, um, then we really had no one to blame but ourselves. And so, I think what I'm in support of this proposal, and there might be some tweaks here and there, but I think what it does is it addresses or attempts to address concerns that our stakeholders have, very important stakeholders, and um, 
continues to uh, try and look at ways that we can, as a regulatory agency, um, you know, study these issues. And uh, you know, I, I agree with Trustee Tony that uh, we need to uh, have a, have a report. Um, we need to uh, see what the recommendations are. We can only do so much um, because we are dependent upon uh, certain stakeholders and um, and the changes that can only emanate from them. So um, I would move this item forward um, if I can do that at this point. So there's a motion on the floor from Vice Chair Stallings. Uh, Brandon, may I ask, are you moving the staff recommendation as presented only? I am. Okay. Is there a second for that motion so that we can debate it? This is De La Cruz, I'll, I'll second it. Thank you, Trustee De La Cruz. Okay, so the motion on the floor is staff's recommendation as presented. You can see it there on your screen. Um, uh, I know that you've reviewed it in preparation for the meeting. Uh, debate on this motion, please. Uh, Mr. Stallings, your hand is still up. Do you want to uh, add anything else? I see it's gone down. Trustee Broughton, please. Yes, um, I guess I have a question. Currently, the um, committee is suspended. They aren't, they aren't participating, if I understand that right. And I guess my question is what um, Trustee Tony says is accurate, that if we don't pass this, the um, committee will continue its work as previously constituted, or will that, I mean, I'm not sure exactly what a no vote on this would do, if anything. Go ahead, Ms. Wilson. Yeah, I think he's accurate. I mean, it was suspended via um, staff action in consultation with the, the board chair. So it could certainly resume, anticipated with resuming. Thank you, Ms. Wilson. Trustee Broughton, any other questions? No, I'll just say that I am in support of this. Like um, Trustee Tony, I wanna see what the end result is. I think that's exactly why we constituted this committee was to explore things. Uh, this reminds me, this entire uh, sort of endeavor reminds me of when years ago, uh, attorneys could not advertise and uh, all of a sudden the rules changed and we could. It was a huge change in the uh, in the bar and what happened. So I'm I, I want to see uh, what what the ultimate outcome, if any, we may decide not to do anything. But I agree. I, I want to see what this committee um, can come up with. Thank you, Mr. Broughton. Anyone else have something to add, Trustee Sowell? Yeah, I, I took the time to uh, obviously try to do the due diligence on this and, and read the, the staff report. Um, I think, uh, and maybe it's just uh, how my, my brain is operating today, but um, would it be possible for folks just to explain to me what the, uh, the first three uh, points in the resolution actually um, mean? Bridget, can you go ahead? Sure. You mean under what the what the charter would do, what yeah. we would recommend? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And and we can you know this we can take further direction from you all too. The idea is that we could ad amend the charter to have some more specific direction to the working group as far as bring the board back recommendations specifically on these items like the, the way that it's worded right now it doesn't include specific recommendations for you know tell us how the legislature and the supreme court will you know will function in the midst of what you're we're recommending for the sandbox so that's why we were suggesting hearing some of the concerns out there we could amend the charter to tell the working group to expressly come back with recommendations on these things um so the first one is with respect to the legislature and the Supreme Court, there's been a lot of discussion about, you know, the whole idea of a sandbox is you let somebody come in and certain existing laws and rules would be waived as to these people so that you can see, we, we would measure and see whether 
you know, they are in fact increasing access to justice, whether there is additional harm to consumers when you don't have these rules in place. It's a way to, that the concept of, of the sandbox really is to, um, to, to assess these things in a controlled environment before you would just change the rules. But the, how the rules would be changed, who makes the decision about which rules can be changed, um, especially given the kind of dual roles of the Supreme Court and the, and the legislature in these areas, especially with respect to the unauthorized practice of law, have caused a lot of discussion and concern. And so we, we added this first one in here to have a, you know, to as a suggestion to direct the working group to come back to the board with a specific mechanism for how that might work, how these rules might be amended or statutes might be exempt under what circumstances. Um, the second one, similar lines has to do with, you know, concerns that you've heard today. Mr. Tony just talked about, you heard about it a lot in public comment. A big question is, you know, what, if we get rid of this rule 5.4, which is this independent judgment rule, and you have um, corporations now, and you know what happens to the independent judgment of attorneys if you have corporations or non-lawyers owning these law firms, will they still be acting the best interest of, the, of their clients or will they be beholden to these corporations? Um, be legitimate, important concerns. And so again, this would be, the reason that we put this in here would be a, a specific direction to the working group to come back to the board with how are you planning to address that particular issue with the sandbox? What would you do to make sure that doesn't happen? Um, the third one has to do with it, it, the, the original charters we linked to in the materials. In addition to coming back to recommend with recommendations on how to implement sandbox, it also asked the working group to um, bring the board revisions to the lawyer referral services rules and also uh, the lawyer advertising and solicitation rules, as well as consideration of whether or not we should add an additional rule um, 5.7 based on um, ABA model rule 5.7 that has to do with law related services. And so this recommendation would actually relieve the working group of, that, of those additional assignments and allow them to just focus on the recommendation for implementation of the sandbox and the and rule 5.4, which is really related to the sandbox implementation. Does that answer your question? It, it does. It, it, Ms. Grammy, and the, um, if I were to go back to um, what Mr. Tony was suggesting, that the working group continue as is, um, would it not look at these particular issues um, without in the absence of this of this resolution no i think it i i do believe it will i mean it already has been considering these issues um but this is just a way to affirm the board's direction that it, it cares about these issues and that specifically is asking for recommendations on this issue i do think the board i mean the working group has been considering all of these things they've been working on these things Except for the rule, the additional rules, which ha we haven't been focusing on as much yet. And I would just jump in and say, you know, if the board is uh, not inclined to go with staff's recommendation, which it seems like there are some questions about that, I would just um, really urge at, at least the streamlining of the scope, because I do think it's fair to say that after a year or so of operation, um, the sandbox itself is a tremendous amount of work. And so adding on the additional um, elements that are not integral to the development of the sandbox proposal itself, it, it makes it even more uh, so. So, um, so just to sort of make a pitch for at least allowing us to streamline uh, the focus a little bit. Thank you, Ms. Wilson. Uh, thank you, Trustee Sowell. Any other follow-up questions to your original question? Looks like not. Any other member of the Board of Trustees care to offer anything? Okay, before we uh, go to the vote on the motion, I, I, I will just add that um, I understand Trustee Tony's sort of ultimate point here and acknowledge that you know letting the working group sort of just continue and and ultimately finish um, is an option that makes sense 
but I do want uh, I do want to express my opinion that I think it's important to be for the board to acknowledge officially on the record, whether it's through, through this resolution or some other way, that um, we are we have heard the concerns that have been expressed by various stakeholders. Um, that it's important that we acknowledge and seek the um, the input of the Supreme Court and the legislature in particular in this particular effort and then, and essentially uh, it's always been my understanding as as a trustee even before I was chair that um, the work of this committee would make its way through the state bar and ultimately find its you know find its um, its way in front of both the court and the legislature in the normal course you know it's it's very rare that the state bar acts alone on something like this and certainly it was never my thought or intention that we would do so here especially we're talking about you know a fundamental shift in um, the way uh, Californians get legal help that they need and so I like that this staff recommendation makes that clear um, I like the narrowing of the focus a little bit um, in, insofar as you know maybe we'll get to the ultimate recommendations sooner than not um I, I like the streamlining um, simply because I think it it is um, judicious and a, res a responsible way to, to continue to proceed given sort of where we are 15 months into this process. That's that's another um, valuable piece of this exercise in particular to me, which is it exhibits to us and to our staff and to the folks who are, are watching us that we, we, we have the ability um, and the desire to, uh, to adjust where necessary and prudent. And so I think this is one of, those, one of those places where it is necessary and prudent to adjust, reaffirming our commitment to working with our stakeholders. Um, and, and ultimately, I think as trustee Tony suggests, giving um, the respect to Justice Tucker and her group um, to, to get some work product from them and then take it to the next level. So those are my thoughts. Um, if there are no further questions or comments from the board, seeing none, Madam Secretary, may we have a vote, please? Sure, give me one moment. Okay, um, so this was moved by Brandon, uh, uh, Trustee Stallings and seconded by Trustee Dela Cruz. Uh, Broughton? Yes. Chen? Yes. Cisneros? Aye. De La Cruz? Yes. Delan? Ganong? Yes. Salag? Yes. Shelby? No. I'm sorry, what was that? No. Oh, thank you. Sol? No. I'm a reluctant I. And I would just like to say that um, uh, I do believe that we need this information and if refining the scope helps with that, uh, I'm fine, but I do not want my vote here to be any indication that I am um, uh, somehow a, a fan of where it is that we're going with this. Stallings? Yes, and with a, a similar uh, explanation as Trustee Soul. I think we're all probably in that boat. Tony? Nay. The motion carries. Thank you, Madam Secretary. Thank you, uh, trustees and staff for the engaging discussion. Um, I look forward to seeing this process move forward. Ms. Wilson, did it look like you maybe were gonna say something? Nope. No, I just wondered if you were gonna introduce a separate motion to add a board member. Or two. Um, I, I, yes, so I, I would like to make a motion that uh, the board delegate to me the authority to um, negotiate with some of you um, and uh, appoint one attorney member and one non-attorney member uh, to the working group, which has now a reduced scope and hopefully fewer um, uh, meetings and time commitments, um, and to trust me to do that uh, and so that the next time the working group meets, um, the board will be represented. This is stalling, so moved. Jose, second. Any discussion or debate on that? Okay, may we have the vote? 
Broughton? Yes. Chen? Yes. Cisneros? Aye. De La Cruz? Yes. Galen? Ganong? Yes. Salag? Yes. Shelby? Aye. Sol? Aye. Stallings? Yes. Tony? Aye. The motion carries. Great, thank you very much. Let's move on to item 704, which is a request to circulate for public comment on a proposed new rule of procedure regarding the provisional licensure program. I see that uh, we have Michelle Crampton or Erica Doherty on, maybe both, um, on deck. So we'll let them join. I see Ms. Doherty. Hi, good afternoon, thank you. Good afternoon. Um, so I will be brief. Uh, this is a set of um, rules of procedure um, to be used in the state bar court concerning provisional licensed, um, provisionally licensed lawyers. I'm going to refer to them as PLLs um, just to make it a little bit easier on myself. Um, so as you're likely aware, um, the California Supreme Court authorized the provisional licensure program by adopting rules 9.49 and 9.49.1 of the California Rules of Court. Essentially, this program um, made it possible for individuals um, to engage in the temporary practice of law um, when they either had not taken the bar exam or had not passed the bar exam um, at, a, at the certain cut score at that time um, during the pandemic. Uh, as part of this program, the PLLs are subject to the disciplinary authority of the Supreme Court and the state bar. And they are also subject to termination from that program um, upon imposition of any sanction for misconduct by the state bar. So the rules proposed today uh, create a process to adjudicate alle allegations of misconduct made against PLLs in the state bar court. And essentially uh, a disciplinary matter against a PLL will proceed in the same manner as it does against a fully licensed attorney. Um, but there are a few key distinctions that I thought I would summarize. Um, first of all, in regards to a criminal conviction, a PLL that is pace, placed on interim suspension or on an involuntary and active enrollment due to their conviction um, would not go through the discipline process in the state bar court. So that individual would be referred to the Office of Admissions to terminate them from the provisional licensure program. Um, if the PLL does go through the state bar court, the state bar court's decision or opinion would be limited, would be limited to whether or not the PLL has engaged in misconduct and whether or not um, based on that misconduct, the state bar court would be ordering a reproval or recommending a greater level of discipline. Um, the state bar court does not need to necessarily go through the process of evaluating whether it should be a you know, 30 day suspension or a state suspension or disbarment because the rules indicate that they are um, terminated from the program upon any sanction for misconduct, which is a reproval or greater. Um, a uh, couple other key distinctions, there's um, the rules propose that uh, no monetary sanctions would be ordered against a PLL and that the PLL would not be responsible for disciplinary costs. And then um, probably the biggest distinction is that the um, state bar court's authority over these um, proceedings would end on June 1st of this year, June 1st, 2022 because um, the individuals are no longer engaged in the program as of June 1st of this year. Um, there is a small group that that does not apply to. And those are what are called the pathway individuals. Those are the individuals that may be eligible to become fully licensed through this program under 9.49.1. Um, that rule instructs that the proceeding in the state bar court would continue to figure and to determine whether or not they would qualify for permanent licensure as part of that pathway program. Um, as you've seen in the agenda item, we're seeking a 45 day public comment period and I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have concerning these rules. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Doherty. Any questions? Mr. Broughton. So I almost hesitate to do this, but um, essentially the um, PLLs will be subject to the same rules of professional conduct that uh, I guess regular attorneys are. Is that is that fair to say? Yes, they, they already are subject to those rules. So um, when an individual has um, applied to become a provisionally licensed lawyer, they have to um, agree to be to abide by those rules as and, and also agree to be subject to the discipline of the state bar and the Supreme Court. And here, here's sort of my question is that the 
agenda item talks about convictions um, of crimes. And yet, uh, those of us might remember, we had a rather robust discussion about um, reporting the filing of criminal charges against an attorney. I don't, and that, that essentially that there's a notice that goes out to the public that this attorney is now facing some sort of criminal charges. Um, is that, and that's not a conviction. So I guess my question is, does that provision also apply to PLLs? I mean, assuming that they are, um, that their profile is subject to public review. So I may have to defer that question because that relates to the consumer alerts. Is that correct, Mr. Brown? I think so. I mean, they're not they're not suspended or anything as a result of the filing of that. But um, you know, we we there is a there is an issue there about that. So I, I'm happy to take that, Erica. Um, and so so importantly, um, the proposal that that Erica is describing now doesn't affect that one way or the other. Um, the um, Provisionally licensed lawyers are subject to the rules to the extent that the, that lawyers are subject to the rules, um, and so um, and so so whether or not that means they are subject to having consumer alerts, um, that is that was decided long ago. It was not is not affected by this proposal. I would say, however, that provisionally licensed lawyers don't have the same kind of profile page um, that attorneys do. They are uh, they are listed. Um, uh, through a, a search function on the on the admissions uh, website, and I do not believe the um, functionality was built into that to allow for consumer alerts. I would also uh, express that the key key reason that 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 isn't an issue for a lot of the consumer alerts, which relate to um, being accused of um, stealing twenty five thousand dollars or more of a client's money, um, provisionally licensed lawyers um, by rule are not allowed access to client trust accounts. So a lot of that, those issues are taken taken uh, off the table uh, as a result. Thank you, Ms. Herskowitz. Mr. Broughton, have, have your questions been answered? I think that means yes. Any other questions or commentary from the board? Sarah, I was muted, yes. Thank you. Okay, seeing none, can I have a motion, please? Jose, I'll make a motion. Island, second. Thank you, trustees. May we have the vote? Sorry, I was muted. I apologize. Uh, Broughton? Yes. Chen? Yes. Cisneros? Aye. Dela Cruz? Yes. Delen? Ganong? Yes. Seleg? Slide. I don't see trustee slide. Okay. Uh, Shelby. Aye. So. Aye. Stallings. Yes. Tony. Aye. The motion carries. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, it is not even one o'clock and we're ready for um, what I've been looking forward to very much in addition to what we've done this morning, uh, which is the uh, item on strategic planning. Um, before I hand it over to um, our consultants to present staff report, I wanna just thank trustees, uh, Tony and Stallings for their very good work in, um, the, on, in the background on uh, working with Ms. Wilson and um, Ms. Pai and their group on preparing what you're going to see today um, and certainly uh, thank all of you for the time and attention that you've put to this effort that we started um, seems like a many months ago now but I know it's only probably a month or two so um, with that if we could have Ms. Wilson do you want to kick us off or is it Ms. Pai? Sure I will kick us off and just say that um, we're right on time so uh, that's pretty incredible and um our, our goal today, we have a couple of goals in terms of what I'm hoping um, we can accomplish. Uh, one is to have the board engage in a discussion about the three key questions that were teed up at our January meeting. Um, and it, that's really important, particularly, well, with respect to all three, 
as they will inform our discussion about the draft strategic plan. And really what you have in front of you is, is a draft that as a team, uh, the team of staff consultants, and I, I believe it's fair to say the board working group team, um, believe is pretty well developed uh, other than the implementation steps that you see in the document. I think those are still very much in a, in a true draft form. So we'd like to get some uh, buy off or sign off on uh, the plan itself, other than, as I said, the implementation steps. So dig into the questions and then take a look at the document and, and really let us know if we are squarely on the right track uh, with it, uh, with the idea being that after today, we would go back, finalize the implementation steps, and then be able to bring forward a final plan for board adoption uh, at ideally your next meeting, uh, if possible. So that's just to lay a little bit of the foundation for what I'm hoping we can accomplish today. Uh, and with that, I will turn it over to Cassandra. Thank you and um, good afternoon. It's nice to see everyone again. Um, time flies when you're having fun. Um, Ms. Shelby, I hope you are feeling better. I have not had a chance to check, but I hope you're doing much better. Um, uh, Leah outlined exactly what uh, we'd like to see accomplished. If, if I could put a finer point on it, I think we really want to be sure that this um, body agrees with the four goals that we've set out. And so I hope we spend some good time there. Um, you will see, I hope, a lot of your language uh, that came out of the conversations we had some weeks ago. We don't want to spend a, a ton of time, you know, wordsmithing. I I'll say politely and respectfully that it is really a challenge to try to write a paragraph by committee. But I also want to say that if there are, if there's language or if there are phrases that really give you heartburn, let's flag them and give uh, this team an opportunity to circle back and um, provide some updated language. So again, we wanna just find some agreement first and foremost on goals. And, um, and then as, as Leah said, make our way into um, the, the vision statements um, the strategies, and then give us still a little bit of space to work on implementation steps. So that's really my preamble. And with that, unless there are any questions about just process, I'm going to turn it over to Kelsey to tee up the first part of the discussion, which is this piece around defining uh, our strategic um, uh, questions. Last thing I'd like to do is also echo Mr. Chairman's comments and say that the working group was really, really engaged, really, really helpful, really, really thoughtful, and um, did a lot to get the document to this place. And so for that and the support and, and uh, effort of the staff, we're really grateful. So I will turn it over to Kelsey. Thank you and good afternoon, everyone. Before we dive into the strategic plan outline, there are three key questions that surfaced at the January meeting that we will first address. Specifically regarding the State Bar's role and approach to protecting the public, promoting diversity, equity, and inclusion, and also improving access to the legal system. In a moment, I will pass things over to Mr. Tony to address the first question and invite discussion. But first, I'd like to briefly read our mission statement for context. The State Bar of California's mission is to protect the public and includes the primary functions of licensing, regulation, and discipline of attorneys, the advancement of the ethical and competent practice of law, and support of efforts for greater access to and inclusion in the legal system. We will take about 10 minutes or so to discuss each prompting question and have conversation about the State Bar's role and this will help inform our next conversation as we go through the outline. Um, so Mr. Tony, I'd like to pass things over to you to please give us an overview of the State Board's role in protecting and serving the public and who our public is. Thank you, Ms. Lyles, I appreciate it. Um, so I, I know I was one of the people that brought up this question about who is our public. That's probably why they assigned me uh, for this discussion, you know, let, let no good deed go unpunished, you know how that goes. And so um, really, uh, 
what I'm going to say a, a, a few things that we were thinking about, and I just want a reaction. One is that I think there's a general sense that yes, um, the state bar has a duty to protect and serve all Californians. Okay, so I think that was a consensus. At the same time, I think there's a recognition that um, if you're looking at um, advancing equity, um, treating everybody equally doesn't necessarily advance equity, particularly when you have communities that have been historically excluded from the legal process, um, excluded from legal representation or services. So then you, the, you know, that the um, bar has to uh, provide, um, uh, uh, you know, really look at strategies that increase uh, legal um, uh, services to um, communities that are historically unrepresented and don't have um, access to advice or what have you. So anyway, because um, it's a short discussion, I'm going to stop there and see um, what do people think about the public that we serve? What does that mean to you? Don't be shy, folks. Oh, I see Brandon has his hand up. Yes, Mr. Stallings has his hand up. Yes, Trustee Stallings. All right, so I'll, uh, I guess, uh, jump right in because this is one of the things that uh, Mark and I talked about at length during some of our planning, uh, planning sessions. And, you know, I, I really take a very um, kind of black and white approach to this where we, we're a nation of, of rules. Uh, we have rules that uh, govern the way lawyers uh, behave themselves, conduct themselves with clients. And when I say clients, I mean all clients. I think that one of the discussions we had was um, if we, um, as a regulatory agent agency, if we're beholden to individuals, to corporations, you know, what public do we serve? Do we need to make that distinction? And I say that we serve all of California. We serve mm -hmm. all, all uh, residents. Uh, we serve uh, those individuals who have uh, incorporated as, um, you know, under under the business codes that allow them to do such things, um, we are beholden to laws just like everybody else. And so I, I really didn't want to get into a, um, a parsing of, you know, we serve segment A or segment B of California because we really serve everyone. Um, and I think that's what makes the legal profession, um, in, in my opinion, the most noble profession out there is that we're beholden to the same rules. Um, I, I as a, you know, as a lawyer, I'm, uh, no matter what my practice area, I have the same ethical obligations as lawyers B, C, and D. So I, I love that about our profession. And I think the public can trust that and trust that there's not this um, uneven playing field, depending upon what type of lawyer I am. Um, and the more that the, the public can trust in us as a profession, uh, the more confidence they have in the entire legal system, whether it's criminal law, civil law, family law, workers' compensation law. Um, and it just, it creates this, this uh, continuity of, of trust. And I think that's, that's what the state bar should be about is, is continuing to build the trust of everyone in California. Thank you. Um, Trustee Shelby. Before I respond, can you restate the question? Because I want to make sure that I, I'm aligned. It, it really has to do with when we talk about protecting and serving the public, the state bar, who are we talking about? And, um, you know, you know, how might we do it? Is it, you know, is everybody treated exactly the same? Um, or do we have obligations 
to um, insofar as we serve all, all California residents to make sure that underserved residents um, have some extra attention. No, I appreciate that. Um, you know, it's interesting as a non-attorney, I would probably come to that differently. I mean, just in my experience um, of being on this board over the last year, I think we are perceived differently to different constituencies. I think there are some attorneys who feel like they um, fall under, you know, it's interesting. When I share with people that I sit on the state bar to people who've been practicing forever, some people give me a blank stare, candidly, because they're like, you know, they don't engage with the state bar on a day-to-day -day basis or on a regular basis. When I think about, you know, I think about an example of a, a person who was looking for representation and had no idea that there was legal services. And so I think it would be wonderful to think we could generically serve the public, but I don't even think the public has a, unless you are engaged with the state bar in a very deep and rich way, I think there's a large swath of the public that has no idea that the state bar provides legal services access. And so I do think there has to be a defining. I think there are licensees who are very well engaged from a favorable standpoint, who sit on our 14 to 16 committees and commissions who know the state bar very well. I think there are people, licensees who know the state bar differently because they've been disciplined, right? So they've got a very different representation or interaction with the state bar. I think there are people who have the benefit of engaging through the legal services when you talk about access to justice. But then I think there's a whole swath of folks out there who never once come across the state bar. And, and in this moment in particular, as we are coming out of this pandemic, you know, they say we're in, in, in an endemic, yet we're still still on Zoom communicating with one another. But as we come out of this, um, I feel like the issues that will be impacting access to justice around employment, around health, around housing, around debt are going to are going to surface in a way that are so different that different people will be looking for other levels of assistance that they otherwise did not realize that existed. Not everyone can afford to to pay $700 an hour for an attorney, right? And so where do you go? And so I think we've got to be very intentional about how we perceive and, and clarify who it is that we're serving because we have the benefit of serving a number of different people deal with us differently based on their alignment with the state bar. And so that's why I wanted you to restate that question because um, we wear different hats in different, different arenas with different constituencies, so thank you. Thank you, Trustee, uh, Trustee Shelby. Uh, Trustee uh, Cisneros. Thank you, Trustee Tony, but I think Trustee Broughton had his hand up before. I'm sorry, Trustee uh, Broughton. I, I did, but I, I, I took it down. I guess in some ways, I think who, in answer to the question, who is our public, it depends upon, to some extent, if we're talking about our regulatory function, or we're talking about our non-regulatory function. Mm. Because if it's the regulatory function, then we're talking about somebody who has an attorney who has been mistreated in some way by that attorney. And what sort of access do they have to uh, remedies there? But if we're talking about you know, our access to justice issues or our non-regulatory functions, and I go back to the fact that you know, we are a hybrid organization. It's right. really tough. I don't know any other type of uh, governmental entity that has quite the same charges that we do. Uh, we've got regulatory functions and we've got these other issues. So if you're talking about um, uh, the non-regulatory function, I could simply say it as anyone who has a non-criminal legal issue um, who has a need for an attorney and cannot afford one. That would be sort of the public we're dealing with. Now, it, it's non-criminal because if you're indigent uh, constitutionally, you're going to be appointed a, an attorney by the government. That's why I say, you know, it would exclude that. Um, but all other non-criminal and sort of civil uh, components of people who have needs for attorneys, it would fit within that, within that group. That's who we'd be serving. 
Thank you very much, Trustee Broughton. Uh, Trustee Cisneros. Thank you, Trustee Tony. Um, I just wanna build on what um, the previous speakers have mentioned. I, I absolutely agree um, with Trustee Stallings. I think that the State Bar has a long and, and very proud legacy of regulating the behavior action and success of attorneys across the state and uh, our very um, busy discipline system and, and regulatory system and um, monitoring system, I think is a strong testament to that. But I think to what some of the other speakers have mentioned, I think the, the primary statement that we're discussing here is very broad and it is very complex and it includes not just delivery of fair and honest and successful legal services, but it also embraces access to legal services for everyone. And that's where I think uh, things get very um, complicated. As we have found in other government areas, I can speak to that a little bit, that when we provide services, whatever they might be, not other than legal services, but whether it's forms of public assistance, whether it's providing education, whether it's providing medical services, whether it's providing transportation. What we have learned over many, many, many years is many of the folks we are obligated and required to serve have different needs in the way that they engage with those services. And I believe the same thing holds true for legal services. I'll just give a few examples of non-legal services examples. Um, if someone speaks a different language, we cannot provide our services only in one language. We may need to provide services in various languages to be able to serve all citizens, all residents, everyone, however you want to define that. If, if, if we are uh, requiring payments, not everybody has access to complex and broad bank accounts. Not everybody has expertise. Not everybody can deal with the stock market or investments or complicated financial transactions. So we have to provide various channels for people to engage with our government and, and be able to meet our requirements in order to access services. Uh, the same thing was applied and legally ensconced in um, laws requiring ability and access for uh, physically and mentally disabled people. Everyone providing services, even including private institutions, have to uh, meet certain requirements to be able to serve people with different needs. What I'm concerned about that, that also falls into this description of, of our mission is that we have a, a responsibility to meet people at all levels. And, and I think as some people have already referred to and have referred to in the past, that includes looking at um, how many people can afford the current you know, offerings of legal services in our state. Now to the state and, and to the, our society's credit, there are legal aid um, offerings, which will, some, will in many cases provide services to those who cannot afford it. But does that go far enough? Is that reaching the people who maybe don't have access to those opportunities, and, but still may not be able to afford um, legal services? Uh, so I think when I think of the question, uh, Trustee Tony, that's what I think of. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let me do a time check with Ms. Pai. I realize we're over the 10 minutes. Do we have enough time for two quick comments from uh, Ms. Wilson and Chair Duran? I'm, I'm sure that they're both important. I think we should definitely go forward with them, but I do want to be mindful of the time. Yes, yes, yes. We'll, we'll, we'll take these two as the last two. So go ahead, uh, uh, Ms. Wilson. Okay, I just um, you know thought of something when I heard you speaking, Mark uh, Broughton, um, just thinking about how difficult the question is, um, because even with respect to criminal defense attorneys or prosecutors, for example, I think about our work, non-regulatory, but related to increasing the diversity of the profession. These are two areas, uh, both defense, uh, de the defense bar and the prosecution bar, where there's been a great public recognition of the need to have a very diverse profession, 
given the unfortunate disparities of who is in those systems. So I think it's very difficult to limit our scope. Uh, certainly all, when I also think about folks who uh, have a legal issue, there's a whole nother group of the population that is experiencing a problem in their lives that they don't know is a legal issue. That is what we call the knowledge gap. That's a population that I believe we need to serve. So for me, whenever I start to kind of uh, put limitations around who the public is, I, I'm challenged by that effort because I think the public is the public writ large and that's who we need to serve wherever we find them. As Trustee Shelby indicates, everybody's not positioned in the same way, uh, but we do need to address all of the needs that, that present. So that's my, my comment. Thank you. And Chair Duran, you have the last word on this topic. I want to thank everybody for their input. Extremely valuable. Chair Duran. Thank you, Mr. Tony. My, my comments have already been made, so I won't repeat them. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. The uh, working group will take into account um, all of your input. Ms. And that's a nice transition to Mr. Duran to provide some comments about the State Bar's role in promoting diversity, equity, and inclusion. Thank you, Kelsey. So, you know, these, these conversations all sort of overlap and, and intersect with each other. Um, I am heartened by the fact that uh, it, it's clear to me that, that these issues matter to each of you as individual trustees. The working group uh, with uh, Mark and Brandon and, and Cassandra and her people um, has fleshed out some really, you know, interesting um, ideas for me. And so this is the point of the conversation where, um, you know, the piece of our, of our mission, which is support efforts for greater access to and inclusion in the legal system, you know, really let's flesh out what that means to each of us and ultimately what it's going to mean to the organization moving forward. What does increasing access to the legal system mean? And Jose, your hand is still up, but I think that's a vestige of the last conversation. <laughs> it is. Any, anybody want to jump in? At a certain point, I feel like um, many of our comments are going to echo previous comments um, and the common themes are going to start to emerge, which I think probably, Cassandra, is part of the point of this process and that's a good thing. Um, and you know, the, I will tell you that in our previous, uh, in our background conversations leading up to this meeting, um, some of our discussion uh, relates to, well, you know, these things are so big and, and how, how can we more, you know, how can we put our, our, our heads and our, and, and our, uh, in my mind, our hearts around them um, so that there's some meaningful uh, work product that, you know, we can collectively come up with. We can publish these, these things as a statement of our values and our, um, our plan to move forward. Um, but by the same token, as, uh, as Leah just said, right, well, the, it, the law affects so many people in, in this state in so many ways, sometimes on a you know, daily or weekly basis. And unfortunately, the knowledge gap means that some of those folks don't even recognize that what they're, what they're dealing with is uh, a problem that requires legal assistance and don't even know how to seek access into um, the legal system. By the way, um, there, was some, there was some interesting discussion about what the legal, syst what the legal system even means. Are we talking only about... Um, entree into the civil courts? Are we talking about being dragged into the criminal courts by virtue of being a defendant? I mean, those, those questions are sort of big and, and um, perhaps philosophical, but I think they do merit some discussion here. Mr. Broughton, please. Yes, they do. And um, one of the things that I, as you were talking, I, I thought about was that um, I would hearken back and say, well, uh, Jew is, it's, it's somebody who needs an attorney, they, they always have the ability to have one, but it's more than that. And I, I, you people have heard me talk about this for a long time, but here in this county, in Fresno County, you have one single court now. Uh, there used to be nine separate courts around the areas for all of the uh, people to have access to, and now they don't have access to the facilities. That's not necessarily um, under the umbrella of the state bar, that's more probably under the legislature or under the um, uh, the, uh, the court system, which is also under the legislature. But that's part of access to justice. Also, is just being having a facility or a judge or a courtroom that you can get to 
as opposed to the two to five year delay that we have right now for any legal issue. Right, exactly. That that bare physical, literal access to a, a building where um, people can help. Trustee Shelby. I agree that a lot of, um, you know, I was thinking about what I shared previously. I agree that a lot of it overlaps. But the one thing that kind of sticks out to me is when I hear access to justice, I think of education. Because again, as a person who, you know, is unfamiliar with the practice of law, um, I think it's an education issue in terms of how you, A, what is available to you, and then B, how you, um, how you even navigate what you learn, right? So I think, I think education to me is a very critical piece as it relates to access to justice. Correct, thank you. Um, as folks are thinking and cogitating, I, I do wanna point out something um, that, that strikes me, which is you know, in our mission, uh, support efforts for greater access to and inclusion in the legal system. And so that, that particular word, that greater signals to me, okay, how do we increase, um, how do we increase services? How do we increase people's ability to know that they need legal services and their ability to get legal services from competent, qualified, ethical lawyers? Um, any thoughts on, on that? You know, that to me, it seems like a fundamental presumption, right? And that is our job is to try and make things better and more understanding that that costs money, understanding that um, sometimes people don't even realize that there is a lack. Um, any, any thoughts on those trustees or staff? I Mark. guess, oh, I'm sorry. I'll get you next, Melanie. Go ahead, Mark. Oh, your hand went up, Mark, and then it went down. Oh, I think it was a holdover. Oh, I apologize. But, but while I'm sitting here, um, what was I thinking? It, it, something completely different is it, we've always thought that we needed to have committees and so forth. For example, we used to have the Access Commission and all of these, and many of them have split off. One of the things we haven't really talked about is that one of the things that we could do is support those other organizations and entities that are dealing directly with these various issues support, I don't know, not necessarily by financial support, but probably we could, or some other type of support, as opposed to a direct, uh, you know, creation of uh, something on our own. So maybe maybe not a need to reinvent a wheel, right, but to figure out where we can plug ourselves into um, systems that are already there. Trustee right. Shelby, did you want to, did you want to add something? No, I just wanted to say, I mean, I, I think it goes back to the, it depends on who is, um, I think your point about greater access is critical, but I think it again, it depends on what constituency it's coming from, right? Because how can you how can you do better and more without knowing what is there for those who don't know? And then for those who are engaged, right? How do you provide better and more for what for what their current engagement and relationship is? So I, I think it's, you know, not to beat a dead horse into the ground, but I think it's very important in our conversation that we ensure that we look at the totality of things and not just through one perspective. Thank you. Uh, Brandon, go ahead. All right, thank you, Mr. Chair. So I don't know if this is responsive to your, to your ask, but just where I'm, my thoughts have kind of settled on, on an aspect of access to the legal system relates really to the plight that is faced um, by individuals in rural counties. and. The state bar, uh, we conducted, or we commissioned the uh, California Commission on Access to Justice back in 2019 to study this. And I mean, it got some pretty incredible numbers from it. 75% of low income rural households, um, and this is across the United States, encounter some type of civil legal problem. And uh, when you compare that to here in California, um, rural counties have around one lawyer for every 1,500 individuals compared to San Francisco who has one lawyer for about every 88 individuals who live in the city. Uh, it's it's kind of easy to see uh, that there's geographic needs and some of those geographic needs are um, related to how much the, the jobs pay, um, you know, whether they can, whether individuals who practice in those areas can keep up with student loan 
uh, payments, rising housing housing costs, and you know whether it makes sense uh, given the job market. But that's something that we see every day in rural counties, which is younger practitioners come to let's say a government office, they get their uh, feet wet, they get a couple years of experience, and then they end up going back to a larger jurisdiction like LA or San Francisco, primarily because of of uh, the pay uh, pay difference um, and you know rising costs. Let's say someone wants to have a family and keep up with a two thousand dollar a month uh, law school loan. So I think a lot of the access issues involve economic problems, and I think the state bar is poised to be able to use its voice um, in the relationships that we have with various stakeholders, including the legislature, to try and come up with innovative programs to uh, to entice people to rural areas, to really serve where the needs are greatest. And whether that's through uh, some sort of loan forgiveness programs, um, incentivizing individuals staying uh, by paying for a portion of their, uh, their law school um, tuition um, in, you know, in a rural area, um, anything to help keep those people there. Otherwise we're going to see very needy swaths of our population um, unable to access any sort of legal services. And I mean, that's a very, very real uh, cliff that we're coming to. So I think the state bar can use its, its influence in those areas. Thank you, Brandon. Ms. Lyle is gonna check in on the time because there's one, one other topic I'd like to just put on the table related to some of the stuff we heard earlier today. So do I have a couple minutes maybe? I believe so. <laughs> Thanks. Go for it. Okay, um, and that and that is, uh, you know, I'm hearing echoes of some of the public comment, right? Some of the the issues that we were talking about um, with respect to the closing the justice gap, and I don't want to re, you know, re rehash any of that, except for um, to note that the folks were talking about, you know, access to to justice, access to the legal system, and I think that the paraprofessionals effort that is also going on at, at this time represents some, you know, some. Um, alternative ways of, you know, something new, thinking, thinking of ways to, um, you know, to increase access to, to justice and to the legal system. I'm curious if the board has any observations or thoughts on that, um, on those connections. Okay. All right. I'm sure we'll, I'm sure we'll have more, uh, discussion on these similar issues later. Okay, next. Kelsey, do you wanna kick off the next conversation? Yes, thank you. So thank you for that great input and conversation. Now we're going to transition into an overview of the strategic plan outline. So I'll turn things over to Ms. Pai. I think we need to do DEI. Nope. I think that's right. With Brandon. Oh yes, um, access Brandon. To, access like to, to justice. Invite you to give your remarks as well. I thought that uh, Mr. Stallings had already um, provided his comments, but nope. I'd like to invite yeah, you, Mr. Stallings. That's the nicest way anybody's ever said that. Man, Stallings has talked a lot today, so we have to hear <laughs> from him again. I'll try and keep this as brief as I can, um, but I think a lot of of work has been put into. Uh, the area of diversity, equity, and inclusion, and the state bar, uh, our, our, um, you know, the amount of, of uh, time and resources that we have spent on it has evolved over time. I don't think for any lack of a heart for those, um, for those issues, but more of uh, how our focus has changed through some of the legislative change. And so, um, you know, I think uh, Mark Broughton and I qualify as, you know, like the the old timers here, um, just in, you know, us talking about, oh, you know, back in the day, but really this is going to be a little bit of a back in the day uh, type presentation. But um, our mission currently reads, the State Bar of California's mission is to protect the public and includes the primary functions of licensing, regulation, and discipline of attorneys, advancement of the ethical and competent practice of law. And then what we're going to be focusing on here is and support of efforts for greater access to and inclusion in the legal system. And this was uh, something that was added by the legislature in uh, 2019. And so that begs the key question, and this is a question that I would ask you to keep in mind uh, when we get to discussion, 
And that is what should the state bar's role and focus be in advancing DEI in the profession? And so this is a little bit of a background. Um, prior to the split of the state bar sections or the trade association aspect uh, from the regulatory uh, body, uh, which is now what, now what the state bar is in 2018, um, our DEI scope was fairly expansive and included programs designed to draw young people into the legal profession um, and programs of advocating for judicial diversity in California in the California court system. And I'd like to think that the state bar has played some small role. Uh, today, there's a historic nomination by President Biden uh, to the Supreme Court. And I think that really reflects the, the heart of what the bar has been uh, working towards, which is a diverse uh, bar or events, uh, diverse group of lawyers will hopefully uh, trickle up to a diverse bench. And so that's been the that's been the heart of the state bar, but we've had to narrow that. Um, one of the some of those narrowing uh, steps included uh, stepping back from some of the pipeline uh, programs and where we uh, put a majority of our focus. And so we took a step back and our putting a majority of our focus in, um, uh, in law schools and promoting diversity at that point. Um, there has been significant research done on when individuals choose the path of law and how that starts in, in high school and continues on through college. So I think that there are things that we can continue to discuss and given the, um, yeah, there's, there's always gonna be a resource issue as far as what we can uh, can spend money, what we can spend money and time on, um, that's always going to be an issue, and just how to be most effective with the resources that have been entrusted to us. So, um, I don't know if anybody has any thoughts, just kind of out of the gate, as far as what are what are ways that we can um, now and and again, if we could get more specific, the better for. Uh, for staff to kind of put to paper uh, some of these ideas. I'd really like to come out with maybe some concrete steps that we could take, but are there any areas that the trustees feel like we could do a better job at in the area of DEI and increasing diversity in the, uh, uh, the profession? Ms. Shelby Sanders raised. All right. I guess my, my uh oh, I guess my first question would be, what were the benchmarks that were placed, put in place back in 2019? Because I think it's difficult to talk about what you need to do if you can't measure what you've done. Um, that would probably be my, my first piece in terms of us for, to think about that. The second piece would be, I would imagine once the, um, you know, when you look at the diversity report that gets produced by the staff, once the representation of the attorney population is reflective of the state of California, I think that's one good measurement and tool, but I would also be very, I, I thought that was a great piece that you, you added in terms of high school being a determining factor for some, and I'd love to see what that looks like as it relates to socioeconomic, to race, and to gender, because I, I, I'm wondering in, 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 um, marginalized communities, how that plays out. Is it, in, is it in high school that people begin to think that they wanna get into the law? And I think that becomes important. I think the other thing that we have to think about is internally as for our organization, like have we ever looked from an organizational standpoint in terms of what our workforce looks like? You know, what opportunities are available? What does representation look like? So for me, DEI is just not external to the profession, but it's also internal to the pipeline and representation of the folks that have the opportunity to be employed by the state bar. I'm gonna um, step in, sorry, I see Hylian just, just uh, raised her hand as well, but I did wanna, I actually wanted to ask Leah to address that because we do have, um, we, we do have stat, stats on that and we have looked at that issue. So Leah, if you wouldn't mind. Sure, well, just be, um, speaking to the first question that trustee Shelby raised, the benchmark that was established writ large is, is what you referred to, uh, an attorney population that reflects the diversity of the state, right? So it's a big, big aspirational goal. Um, and then the, the steps that were identified um, with respect to the state bar's role in helping to achieve that goal 
we're very much focused on where the state bar can has the largest span of control, so to speak. So looking at law school retention, when we saw that there's very disproportionate rates of uh, law school dropout rates, and we happen to have an established uh, relationship with all California law schools. So it's a, a great place for us to step in. Bar passage, another point of a significant disparity. We've done a lot of work there. And then retention in the profession. Nationally, we know that women of color are the most likely to leave the profession after about eight years of practice, eight to 10 years of practice. We have not done much work in this area, so much left to do, but that was part of it. So this big sort of aspirational goal and then really looking at where the state bar could have the most significant impact. And, and another thing I would add is that another sort of um, aspect of our understanding of the role is that we are a data collector, a data aggregator, a data analyzer, and we can share data and information uh, in a way that most other organizations can't. So that's a contribution to the space. Um, and then in terms of our staff, we have taken a look at that. And I, I think we did share um, the most recent analyses with the board, happy to do that again. And we saw some things that are uh, positive and some things that are troubling. I think none of which are gonna be a surprise to you in terms of overall, you know, our staff diversity is, is fairly uh, consistent um, in terms of a comparison to the state population. We are underrepresented in terms of our Latino employees at all levels, and particularly at executive levels. In executive leadership, you see that the organization is more and more white. Um, and, and so it's a problem that, that we have and something that we need to work on. So we certainly have taken that to heart um, and collected and published the data. All right, um, and it just, uh, Trustee Shelby, thanks for bringing this up. Um, as far as the pipeline programs, really wanted to give a shout out to Council on Access and Fairness and the work that they've done in this area. And uh, one of the programs that's been developed um, out of that partnership is the 2 plus 2 plus 3 program, which um, starts with individuals at uh, community, community colleges, two-year community colleges, and provides a pathway to, um, uh, to law school and actually preferred placement in some top tier law schools. And I can just speak from here, um, my experience here in Kern County, that individuals are who are, um, they're children of farm workers. Maybe this is the first individual um, who's ever gone to college out of their family. To see them rise up through community college, then a Cal State and then law school and then graduate and get barred and then be a contributing member of the profession is something that's extremely uh, special uh, for um, for us as a community because they can really speak to issues affecting farm work, you know, farm worker families and some of those uh, socioeconomic issues that other people would have no no idea about. So I've seen it work in Kern County, and um, I think that staff has done a really good job of taking the the, the narrow focus that we needed to take in Appendix I. Um, but continuing to work as that aggregator of data. Um, I think as former, uh, former Chair Jason Lee said, um, we should not just be in the business of, of uh, collecting data, but also in the business of influencing change. And so um, to that idea of influencing change, is there any appetite on the board for ways that we could do that and not just be that aggregator of data, but also um, really speak to those those issues. Any anybody wish to speak to that? We've got a couple of hands up, including uh, Trustee right. Chen. Um, Trustee Chen. Thank you. So, just to build on what folks have already commented on, I do think it's a significant. I mean, when I joined the board, there was not a any effort on the part of the state bar to gather information on diversity statistics. And so the fact that there is now, we're building a snapshot year over year of what the profession looks like, I think is a huge move. And I would like to see the state bar continue in the coming years to build on that important work. Now that we have the data, think about what can we do with it? Can we set targets that we expect 
organizations to meet or aspirational goals and things that where we can say, here are things that you can do as an organization, whether you're a government agency, whether you're a private law firm, whether you're a nonprofit, to move the needle on increasing diversity in the profession. Here are things we've seen other organizations do. And to become, I think aggregator of data sounds very dry and boring and not very sexy or full of passion. But to me, I feel like the State Bar can serve a very important role in bringing together all the great work that is being done in silos by various organizations. So, you know, Change Lawyers of California is doing amazing work. There's, do, you know, like you can name like dozens of organizations that are doing really important work to move the needle on diversity. Everybody's got their own conference that they have. The California Minority Corporate Lawyers have their own conference. Everybody's got a conference. People come together, but there's no one entity that's overseeing all of it pulling together the information and the best practices that are learned from those conferences and making it available to everyone. And also saying to everyone, here's what we expect you to do. And so I think the state bar can serve a role in that regard. I just, I've you know, driven diversity efforts at my firm and participated in these conferences year over year over year. And there is a lot of feeling of we're continually reinventing the wheel and continually re-talking about the same things. And if there can be a sort of, I've always wondered whether there could just be like one consolidated knowledge bank of things that have worked, things that have achieved measurable outcomes. So for example, at our firm, we have a pipeline program that helps first-generation students, mostly black and brown students, get into law school and we help them as they progress through law school with mentoring, with test prep, with resume prep, with interviewing prep, with all sorts of, with meet some judges and lawyers who do different things. Why don't we shape those sorts of things into a toolkit that is then available to everyone so that people don't have to continually reinvent the wheel. And then to Leah's point of the lack of women of color in, who remain in the profession past seven or eight years, who achieve positions of leadership, it's a huge problem. And it's a problem in small part because it's people of color and women of color who are asked to do this diversity work at every organization they are a part of. And to see all of us constantly reinventing the wheel is a little tiring. And I think the state bar can create, play an important role in making sure we're continuing to push the ball forward that people don't have to keep reinventing the wheel, especially when the burden falls disproportionately on the people we are trying to help. Well said. Um, Ms. Hershkowitz. Um, thank you. There, there are a number of points that have been made that I, that I wanted to touch on. Um, and since my memory is short, I'm gonna start with trustee, one, a point from trustee Jen um, about sort of the ability to bring people together to think about these things, um, a, a sort of a, an ability that the state bar has that maybe other people don't. And I think this is um, uh, a recent, most recently evidenced in our work with the law schools. Um, and uh, I, we are actually um, very soon going to be issuing a law school retention study where we not only um, following uh, the, the discussions of the board in November of 2019, um, we not only changed the reporting requirements for the um, uh, California accredited state bar accredited law schools and the registered law schools so we could be better tracking the um, uh, retention and attrition of law students of color um, but we took that data and we had focus groups with law schools and we talked to the law schools about what is it that you're doing um, we'd surveyed law students um, to find out if what the law school thinks that they're doing is if they're actually if that's actually having an impact. Um, but we brought together law schools, I think, most importantly, and we're going to be continuing this work as we look at more data um, to really talk to the law schools about okay, you're the, you know this school's data is really good. They've got the following programs. Let's see if those programs are, are successful. Um, and we also, for the first time, sort of brought. Um, brought into our accreditation process, setting as a goal for uh, California uh, accredited law schools um, that they have to meet diversity, equity, and inclusion goals, not numeric goals, but that they have to be doing something to improve that. 
And the reason I'm talking about this is um, because um, I want to be crystal clear about the the um, extent of the conversation that the board has had over the past couple of years about the, what role the board should be playing um, or could be playing in diversity, equity, and inclusion. And, um, and we limited it to, or you limited to sort of focusing pipeline efforts, um, starting at law school and within the profession to ensure uh, recruitment and retention within the profession, not because the board does, not because the board thinks that's where the pipeline starts. The board was crystal clear. The pipeline starts long before law school, but there are other organizations who might be better situated to affect outcomes. Um, and the last thing that, that the public needed for us was to, was to just add on to what other people were doing, just add our Me Too voice, um, but rather step into a place where we were uniquely situated because, for example, of our relationship with the law schools, um, to really dive delve into an issue and work on work on that particular issue and and affect an outcome. Um, and so I just I just wanted to to make sure to 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 talk through that because we did have quite a lot of conversation about the early pipeline and about judicial diversity and how important those efforts are, but that where the bar has necessarily sort of a limit on on how impactful it can be where it can devote its resources that the board de determined that the that the best place to devote those resources to be more impactful was a place where other people maybe couldn't and that was um with the with the law schools themselves and then within the profession um to ensure uh, recruitment and retention all right uh michelle b I wish that the comments section was enabled because I feel like I could just type a whole lot of stuff and not keep bumping into the conversation. Um, and I don't know if that is possible, but um, just two really quick points. Um, a, uh, Highland said a mouthful. Um, and she said a mouthful as it relates to the expectation that the folks who represent a particular community can impact what is transpiring and and I, I think back to one of my very first state bar um, meetings where we were interviewing candidates and probably just by chance I'm confident that this was not purposeful so I want to say that but I was um, asked to ask the question about diversity and inclusion and I've got a very a very um, strong diversity and inclusion background and I remember at that point in time pushing back and thinking to myself gosh you're sitting around this table for the first time. This is the lane that you stand in, yet you've made it very clear that you don't have to be the one that asked the diversity and the inclusion question. And I appreciate it was Jose Cisneros who stepped up and said, I'll take that question. I don't have a problem taking that question. But I say that from the standpoint of, it just, it, it struck a, the high lens comment struck a nerve with me because the question really becomes if we talk about influencing the pipeline and I appreciate Donna's very eloquent um, articulation of history, because I think history is really critical and important as you move forward. But the other piece about history is you should always reevaluate and assess that if history, if, if history could still serve you in this current moment. And so maybe one of the places, right, in terms of where the state bar has the opportunity to influence the process is in the decision making capacity as it relates to who is running the law firms, who is running the nonprofit organizations, who is running the governmental organizations, because you're not going to impact retention, and that's just an example right now, if you're not in a leadership position to make a decision, right? We all know that there are advocates, there are supporters, there are decision makers. And so maybe that's a different conversation that we need to be having around DEI is how do we really begin to touch the decision makers in the legal profession to really make movement as it relates to ensuring that the representation of the profession is reflective of the general population. All right, excellent points. Uh, can I do a time check as to what we need to do? We are about six minutes over time, which isn't bad, but I just thought I'd let you know that. All right. Um, Cassandra, just from your standpoint, any other discussion points that would aid your team? 
Um, this has been really helpful. Um, I, you know, I, some of you know, I do a little of this work. I, my bottom line on this and, and my way to summarize it would be that which gets measured gets done. Um, I use that phrase a lot. And so encourage you to um, take advantage of the opportunities you've got to collect data because data always tells the story. It doesn't lie. Um, I see Mr. Tony shaking his head. So um, I'm gonna just ask Ms. Lyles, is there anything else that you wanna add to this discussion? And then I'll ask Leah if there's anything else she wants to add before we make our way into the, the work, the, the rest of the work of the day. That's a very rich conversation. I would just ask or make space for anyone who didn't have an opportunity to speak if they wanted to chime in or add anything before we transitioned. And then uh, Ms. Wilson, you took your mute button off, but that may not have been on purpose. No, I think we'll, we'll come back to these issues when we uh, move into the next section of the agenda. Okay. Um, then, Mr. Chairman, I'm planning to now kick off the discussion on the, the draft outline, if that's okay with you. That would be great. Thank you. All right. And I, I want to start with just a couple of comments and then ask, I hope, is it Dag who's going to pull this up and help me move this around or should we have someone on my team do it? I think you may need to have someone on your team do it. I'm not sure which document you're referring to. All right, then um, Haley, I'm going to ask you while I uh, take a, about a minute or so if you can pull up the outline so we can look at that together. Um, just two observations for me. One, just really great discussion um, in these last 45 minutes that I think reflects a lot of the trust that this group, I think, has established with, the, with each other and certainly a lot of common uh, focus and in, in commonality and in, in thought. The other thing I wanted to take you back to as we pull this document up is um, what you all said in the expectations discussion when we held our retreat. And that was that you wanted this document to reflect some high level thinking, to be aspirational, to be strategic, um, to not go too far into the weeds and that we use you know, maybe a, a companion document to uh, talk about or, or list out some of the operational needs. But, um, you know, again, I think I want to thank the work group, um, Mr. Chairman, um, uh, Mr. Duran, Mr. Stallings, and Mr. Tony, as well as the staff for really um, doing a great job in helping us pull this document together. And by way of process, I'll just tell you that we pulled together all of our respective notes and sort of started from here and, and you know sort of whittled this document down to what you've got in front of you. I think um, if you don't mind, I'm gonna go straight to the, uh, the goal section and that preamble, which for every good reason you would expect and, and really truly a reflection of the discussion we just had, um, you know, calls out the fact that the mission is rooted in protecting the public um, talks about the fact that these goals reflect the organization's vision for realizing that mission over the next five years, but also calls out um, the commitment to advancing um, diversity, equity, and inclusion with respect to both operations as well as the profession itself. So we did what you asked us to do, and, and we did a lot of what you see reflected in, um, in, in the conversations we just held, had. So as I said to you, I want to spend the bulk of our time getting your reaction first to these four goals. And I suppose it would be helpful. Um, I, I'll, I'll let you all decide, Mr. Tony or Mr. Stallings or Mr. Duran, just to maybe share your thoughts. Um, you certainly shared them with us on where we got to in these four goals. One of the things Mr. Stallings said is that this was a fun um, and insightful process. So um, since you said it was fun, let's start with you and just you know, go, go to the four goals and just you know, give, give your, your colleagues, if you don't mind, um, just your general re response or, or reaction to how, how and where and, and where we got to with, with this list, if you don't mind. Yeah, so I definitely have a, a crazy idea of what fun uh, is, is made up of. 
Um, but what goes into that, that determination is so often I think we see words on paper and we can infer and say, you know, five, five to 10 different things. And those five to 10 different things are received differently by everybody else. And so what I really learned through this process is that when I say a certain term, Mr. Tony might hear something because that's his, because of, because of his background, because of his expertise. And so I think really approaching this process from a collaborative standpoint and appreciating the life experience of each trustee member, I think really helped me get to know um, where trustees are coming from in a much, uh, much better way. And so I really appreciated the process. That's what I found fun about it. And uh, yeah, that's all we got. Okay, anything just relative to the goals or just your overall endorsement? Overall endorsement, yes. All right, thank you. And Mr. Tony, any comment on, on the, the goals? Sure. Um, I thought it was very good to work um, very closely with your team and especially with uh, Brandon and Ruben. Um, we, um, what, what I'm happy about is that when we have number one, protect the public by strengthening the attorney discipline system, <clears throat> that when you look at the five-year plan strategies, there's you know a, a clear um, uh, you know uh, emphasis on reducing the backlog of unresolved disciplinary cases. Uh, I think that was important to put it in writing, to put it up front, because it is absolutely something we uh, need to, as a state bar, make sure that we focus on and we prioritize. And yes, you know, we've got new case processing standards, improve operational practices, you know, uh, focus resources on cases posing most significant risk. And that's important, but we've got to also reduce the backlog of the disciplinary cases. Um, we've heard that over and over from stakeholders that that is incredibly important. And I'm really pleased that we got to a place where it is uh, a central focus. I think that's important. Thank you. Mr. Chairman? Just very quickly that I agree with both uh, Mark and, and Brandon and, and what they've laid out. The only thing that I think I'll add is uh, I very much like the focus um, both, you know, visually that those bolded for protecting the public by protecting the public by and acknowledging and realizing that everything we do ultimately must go to the protection of the public and we can protect the public by increasing access to uh, the legal system and justice and, and by ensuring a diverse profession. I, I think it ties it up very nicely. I certainly hope the rest of the trustees agree, but um, certainly I'm going to say for my, myself, I'm not going to have too much pride of authorship here. I love, I love the power of the red pen and the, and the track changes. And I know Cassandra said we're not going to uh, wordsmith here today too much, but certainly that shouldn't mean that um, any of us should, should feel constrained from offering a different point of view here. Um, this, is, this is the intention of this process. Absolutely. And, and I, again, I, I, my, let me let me say that I, I did say I don't don't want us a wordsmith, but but I also want to say if there's a word or a phrase that really gives you heartburn, let's call it out. We'll track it and we'll 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 figure it out. So with that, thank you so much. Um, let me just ask if we can get just some feedback overall on the on the goals, particularly, you know, as Mr. Chair pulled out this notion of protect the public by you know we've named it four ways where. We're proposing to do that over the next five years. Just any any general feedback, any heartburn, any um, you know o overall endorsement, or you know I'm, I'm, we're, we're, we we want to hear some feedback, and then we'll start to go into the the detail. We really want to start with the top level goals, if you don't mind. And I think I have everybody on screen, and I don't see any hands. Any did we really do that great a job? I know some yes. of my team had some suggested as I see Mark uh, Broughton's hand up. Let's start there, Mr. Broughton, please. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll throw my hat in the ring here. I'm not sure I completely understand goal number three, 
um, provide education resources and support for the legal profession. When we try and uh, sort of direct ourselves towards the attorneys, that's kind of where we get in trouble with the public because we're supposed to be supporting you know, the public. Um, I think I understand it, it, it is that we're, we're gonna try and help lawyers so that they don't get into trouble. I, I, think, I think that's what that means, um, but I'm not sure that it's worded quite that way. And then on number four, um, I, I don't get that one at all as, as, a, as a goal for this organization in, in five years. Engage partners. I'm not sure who the partners are. Um, to enhance public protection, to me, it's kind of circular. We're, we're talking about public protection and then we say enhance public protection and restore the state bar's credibility, reputation, impact. I, I don't really know what that means, even as an overall uh, goal. So those are just some really initial thoughts. You did in, in calling that, that one also um, help me to notice that we've got a typo um, in point three, it should be promote the ethical, not ethnical. So part of my answer to your question is that is protecting the, is, is this, as I understand it, is about supporting the profession ultimately to be sure that law is practiced both ethically, not ethnically, ethically, as well as um, with, with, with some degree of competence, a great degree of competence. On your second question, and again, I'll, you know, we're gonna keep the discussion going. We, inc we included, or we considered, and, and again, I'll let the, the group speak. Um, you know, there are a variety of stakeholders that you know that we um, engaged in um, you know, feedback in this process. And um, that's you know, everything from the, the legislature, um, to, to committees, organizations, other entities and groups. But um, I will ask again, you know, do, I see other hands that are up, but is there anybody else in the group that wants to just respond to the concern that, or, or questions raised by um, Mr. Broughton? And I see you, you're nodding, Mr. Duran, so please. Yeah, thank you, I appreciate that. Um, sure. And and Mark, I have to tell you that that uh, I'm not exactly surprised to hear somebody on the board express what you've expressed, um, and there was some back and forth among the group. And in, in my mind, let me let me tell you why I think this formulation still works, at least with respect to number four, um, and that is, um, it has become increasingly clear to me over the years, and especially now as I sit as the chair of this of this body, that we really cannot do anything effectively um, without the buy-in of the court and the legislature. We really are, you know, we, we really are partners with them in ensuring um, uh, that the public is protected and that, that attorneys are appropriately disciplined and that we prevent the need for discipline um, by providing the stuff that we're talking about in number three. Um, and so if you look at the, the the end of that sentence, um, and it's a, a little bit of a nod to um, some of the conversation that uh, we had at our last strategic planning session with respect to um, restoring our credibility as an organization and the impact that we're able to have and to enable to be able to do that. I, I think it is important that we acknowledge the importance of, um, I mentioned, you know, two of our partners, but there are many. The law schools are an example. Um, the uh, practicing lawyers in the state and the, um, the various organizations that they use to uh, advance their own, their own interests. We interact with them on a regular basis. Let's do that. Um, uh, let's acknowledge that we do that in, in, our, um, in our policy document here. So that was, that was my thoughts on it. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Leah, did you have your hand up to respond to Mr. Broughton or you raised something else? No, I did. I wanted to say in terms of number three, I, I agree like my initial um, reaction to that verbiage was um, to kind of cringe, right? Because this has to do with that shift when we separated. Um, but I do think even if we decide to word it differently, the sentiment is the right one, right? Because 
to continue to be a purely a responsive agency, we respond only to the complaints that come in, is a really limited view of our public protection role. Um, if we can change our orientation so that we are focused on preventing misconduct and educating the consumer so that they can advocate for themselves, we are going to advance our public protection role in a way far beyond what we're able to do just by responding to complaints. And then with respect to number four, I, I see George uh, has turned his video on and I know he had some good um, proposed edits to that, uh, just to make the language a bit, a bit cleaner. Um, but I think this one is critically important because we can't achieve anything in one, two, or three without more effectively working with our partners. We can see that come up today, certainly with respect to the Sandbox Working Group. We're gonna see it with the paraprofessionals. We're, we're gonna see it with the Client Trust Account Protection Program, which we'd very much like to implement, but we can't do it without the support of our partners. So in every single one of these areas, we've got to reestablish or improve these relationships in order to help us succeed. And I think that is, the sentiment, again, it could be uh, worded differently, but that's the, the spirit of it. Thank you, Leah. I'm gonna ask Mr. Cardona, to, since your hand is up, to please go ahead and comment. Sure, this is somewhat similar to that point, but um, I first I was gonna suggest potentially changing the word supporting to be regulating. Um, which I think ties back to one of the priorities that's stated, which is regu regulation of the bar. And I think I just wanted to make the point that following mm -hmm. up on Mr. Tony's point that, um, you know, we want to work down the backlog. You know, one of the most effective ways to work down the backlog is to have more of a regulatory presence and more of a preventative presence that will actually potentially reduce the number of um, complaints that aren't really disciplinary complaints, but are really um, complaints about conduct that doesn't rise to the level of disciplinable conduct, but is something that potentially should be subject to regulation and assistance. Um, and so I think if you change that to regulating the legal profession, it would tie back to the mission and get in that kind of in-between thing that you really need to take some stuff out of the disciplinary system and into a regulatory framework. Thank you for that. Before I call on Mr. Seleg, Mr. Broughton, let me just circle back to you really quickly and ask if you've had some of your concerns at, at least you know, partially satisfied in some of the responses from your colleagues. Well, I, I sort of understand make everybody 100% happy. Go ahead, sorry. I think Leah hit part of my concern on the point with number three is that we do have CLA and we split off a lot of that education component of what the bar used to do into that separate section. And I might say something like, it says three, promote, or excuse me, protect the public by supporting the legal profession, colon, promote the ethical and competent practice of law and reduce misconduct. I don't know that we need all that other stuff to begin with, or you could just say it in, in the goal itself. And with number four, I was confused as to who the partners are. After hearing what um, what Ruben said, instead of partners, if we're directing it specifically to our stakeholders or specifically to the legislature, engage the legislature to enhance public protection and restore the state bar's credibility, reputation, impact, or you could say it with the legislature. To me, I what I read that I'm I'm thinking, are we trying to uh, engage people outside of, of the bar, outside of the legislature, you know, get people in from the community. I was confused by what that, that goal was. So maybe it is just language, but um, I think defining exactly what we're trying to do in the next five years will help. Okay, I appreciate that. Let me go to Mr. Seleg. Hey, thank you. Well, <clears throat> well, I'm going to chime in on number three, too. So um, yeah, I was confused by number three standing alone, but when I looked at the, the individual, the more specific um, ways of implementing this that are listed later in the document, I think this is really is about proactive prevention of misconduct. So um, I think we could, uh, except for diversity, which is repeated in the bullet points for three and two, and I'm not sure diversity fits here so well, if you reframe it as protect the public proactively 
period. That would be the title. And then just slightly edit the sentence to say, provide education resources and support for the legal profession to enhance public protection. Here's the change by promoting the ethical and competent practice of law, thereby reducing misconduct. Because that's what the action items seem to do. And that's more consistent with our mission as um, a deunified bar. I've heard a couple of edits, all, all um, legitimate on particularly point number three. Um, and I, I think we're getting there. Again, I don't want to use this time to, to rewrite the paragraph, but I definitely taking the feedback and, and, and um, my team is taking notes. Um, so thank you for that. Let me ask Ms. Chin and then I'll go to Mr. Tony to please. Go ahead. Yeah, just a quick point again on number three. I do wonder whether it is important to explicitly call out prevention because I think it it is going to be confusing to many members of the public and to other stakeholders what we mean by this. But when you say prevention, that's just automatically understandable to people. Now, perhaps you didn't want to include prevention as a goal because you can never prevent 100% of all misconduct. And so maybe that's why you used reduce. But I do think prevention is just much more understandable to people as to what it is you, you mean. Would it be Highland like protect the public by preventing attorney misconduct? Yeah, or talking, I mean, I like Sean's proposed edits where you're talking about we're gonna accomplish these things through education that thereby prevents, right? You're, you're providing tools and education to help attorneys avoid engaging in misconduct. Okay, I hear it. I, I, I see a couple ways to do it, to do that. Um, okay, thank you for that, Mr. Tony. I, I really appreciate this discussion. And I do think that um, we definitely wanna work on number three and you know try to figure out how to make it more clear that it is uh, preventing um, legal misconduct that we're looking at and how to highlight that. So that um, I'm eager to uh, go back with the working group to, to work on. I do wanna say on number four, um, it's kind of deliberately ambiguous, okay? And, you know, I mean, part of it is putting this in here one is so that the state bar acknowledges to ourselves and to the public that we have a serious, serious deficiency when it comes to credibility and reputation in particular. Um, that is historic. And um, there are parts of what we do today that contribute to that. So I think it's, um, so, so part of it is um, being transparent that we recognize that we need to um, improve the public's trust of the state bar. So that's one. Two, mm -hmm. you can't do it by yourself. No organization can restore trust by itself. You got to work with partners, okay? People have already suggested um, the legislature, the Supreme Court, um, um, uh, law schools. Um, I would add to that the state auditor. I would add to that the media. Um, I've, we should be viewing them as partners as far as I'm concerned, okay? Because they have a role in protecting the public. And this list is not exhaustive. I, I, I think there are a lot of other potential partners out in the community. And so I think there's value to leaving this open-ended, so to say, so that we um, strive as much as possible to um, work together with other entities so that we can rebuild the um, credibility, trust, reputation that will help the state bar be more effective um, in fulfilling its mission. Thank you. I hope that answers uh, some of those concerns as well. Mr. Seleg, you have your hand up again, or is that from your prior comments? You're on mute, sir. Sorry, that's negligence. <laughs> <laughs> I should have lowered. That's all right. That's a good word. 
other comments on the goals? I'm sorry, Mr. Barton, is your hand still up again or is this- Oh, I might as well say, throw it again again and then I'll, I'll be quiet. I, I, I kind of disagree uh, a little bit with um, Trustee Tony. I think if you're setting out a goal, something you're gonna measure and you're going to try and achieve, that it should be perhaps a little bit more defined and not ambiguous. Um, so I, I, and to me, it was confusing because I still don't know what partners is and exactly what we mean. So we know if we're getting towards our goal. The other thing I just throw this in, and don't you love uh, uh, editing things with a whole bunch of lawyers? So, <laughs> so it's my favorite is, thing to do. <laughs> when, I, when I look at one through four, I mean, just just a different way to do it you you could say protect the public by colon one strengthening the attorney discipline system two uh, enhancing access to an inclusion in the legal system three supporting the legal profession or however you want to say it four uh, engaging partners so that you don't necessarily are continuing to say that uh, protect the public over and over again and your eyes focus directly on the goal and what it is that you want to do. I'm done. Okay, we'll take that as, as they say under advisement. I, I, do, I, I'm just jumping in to say, I think when we get to the next level of detail on yep. goal four, a lot of Mark's Broughton's questions are gonna be clarified because there is some more specificity there. I hope so too. I think so, and I hope so. I'll say it that way. Um, Haley, I sent you an email. I don't know if you can pull up that language that quickly, but I'll tell you all that, you know, I, I think there were some good comments in this last segment. And what I will say is I did not, what, what I heard was a little bit around language and style, but I don't think I'm hearing any disagreement on where we got to relative to these aspirational goals. So if that's the case, number one, it warms my heart. Um, number two, congratulations to um, the working group for I think getting very, very close to getting this right. And I think uh, that, that uh, Ms. Wilson is right. Let's start to maybe scroll down Haley um, into some of the specifics on the plan, unless you were trying to pull my email up. In which case, I, I know I'm being demanding, but I'm on the line with a bunch of lawyers, so. I was, so would you like to go back to the document? We can scroll. Oh, do you think, can you pull it up pretty quickly? I'm trying right now, but. So Cassandra, I excuse me for interrupting, I apologize, but I noticed that we have a we have a, a break built in at, built in at 2.30, which is in 10 minutes. We can take yes. it now, let Haley get what she needs, and then we can come back just 10 minutes earlier than our anticipated break. We can, we, we, you are the chair. We can do whatever you ask us to do, sir. <laughs> and and people great. probably are feeling a little squirmy. So let, let's, sure, let, let's do that. It's 2.19, let's come back at 2.30. We were gonna take a, oh, we were gonna take, I think a, yeah, we're gonna take a 10 minute break. That's perfect. So let's just um, take a break now. We'll see you at 2.30. Great, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thanks, Haley. I'm gonna stay on.
Thanks. Bye. Okay. Welcome back. And I want to close out the first portion of our discussion pretty quickly, just with, again, hopefully Haley can pull up something that I just scratched up and, I, and I'm doing this partly so that you all really understand that we're, we're listening and we're gonna do our best to incorporate your thoughts um, into this document all the way through. But I, again, I'm gonna say from a substantive perspective, I'm really happy that we're supportive of the goal. So I think you can see this promote, I start with promote the ethical and competent practice of the law and prevent using your word misconduct by providing education resources and support for the legal profession to enhance public protection. So again, I want um, you know, Mr. Broughton, Mr. Seleg, those of you who weighed in just to see that we can, you know, I think there's some ways for us to, to move some of this language around and still be sure that we're capturing your comments and sentiments. So you don't have to give me an overwhelming thumbs up or, or applause at the moment, but I want you to- <laughs> It looks good to me. Thinking about, okay. So Haley, thank you for that. And let's go to the meat of the outline, please. And so with the goals, you know, sort of with, with some consensus, what feels like consensus around the overall goals, Again, we don't have to go through every line in this next sec segment, but I do want to be sure that if you, there are things that either give you heartburn or that we want to be sure that we are clear about that you just weigh in, um, weigh in there. And we've got, um, by my estimation, about an hour and a half to do this. And so I think that's plenty of time. Um, so let's start with goal one. And do we want to start with you, give me one set, uh, one favor and go back to vision? Yeah. So, because I want to talk a little bit about format. So, each of these goals has the vision. I mean, again, going back to what you all said at the outset of this process that you, 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 and I have to call out Mr. Tony, um, you know, saying that it's important for us to talk about our aspirations and what our vision of success looks like. And so, we tried to do that with each of the goals. So under this one, you see the vision, and that is the state bar discipline system is and is recognized as effective, fair, and timely. And then now you can scroll down a little bit, um, Haley, and let us just take a look at some of the strategies. Any comments or feedback? Anything missing? Can you include the, uh, just go up a bit so I can see the goal also as, there we go, okay, thank you. All right, I'm, I hope I'm seeing nods and I'll even take a thumbs up if I am worried, but so far so good, okay. So again, let's scroll down to implementation steps, if you don't mind, Haley. You know, to Leah's point at the outset of this conversation, some of these are based on um, staff input feedback from our stakeholders. This is where we will do some, uh, some builds and, and certainly we will take your feedback or any comments um, into account, but anything here? Okay, I have a feeling we're gonna spend more time on three and four, but let's go on uh, down. Haley to let's keep the vision in the frame. There we go. Okay. 
and this is access to and inclusion in the legal system. The vision is all Californians have access to quality, affordable, and culturally relevant legal advice. And there are some five-year strategies. I'll give you a chance to take a look at those. Anything missing? Anything that's not clear? Cassandra, if, if I may, I'm, I'm, um, I'd like to ask the question of folks understand what culturally, culturally relevant legal advice means or what your thoughts on it might be. Because <laughs> um, that's, not that's not a phrase that we, uh, that many people see every day, um, lay people certainly, and maybe not a lot of lawyers. So I'm just curious. Comments there? It just goes to show you how times have changed, Mr. Chairman. I think many of us are accustomed to that statement. Now, go ahead, Mr. Broughton. I'm just wondering, what is it, if you want to explain it? Do you want to do that, Reuben, or do you want somebody else? Yeah. I, I will let someone else. I didn't, I didn't pin that phrase. I have my own thoughts, but I'm not sure that they're in the, in the vein of what Cassandra might mean when she's thinking. I'm going to let Leah take that. Okay. Sure, Kelsey. Okay, well, I'll, I'll jump in. Um, can you point me to exactly which one? If that's the vision, there yeah. you go. Oh, the vision statement, okay. Um, so I think, uh, Mark, what it means is first of all, like the obvious one is language access. Um, a second point that I think is equally as important is um, addressing sort of implicit biases or explicit biases that providers or we may all have and how that comes uh, to bear or comes to play in the interactions that um, lawyers or those providing legal advice or legal services are providing to clients. Um, and so we know we have um, a state bar rule right now, uh, kind of addressing uh, this kind of behavior. There's been a lot more focus on culturally competent practice so again, it's not just language. It can be things like making comments about people's hairstyles that is uh, makes them feel uncomfortable or the way that they're dressed or the way they talk or the community that they live in or the values that they might be demonstrating or the things they might find important. So um, I think that's what, it, that's what it means to me is that part, part of our work is to help the profession be able to meet uh, clients and potential clients where they are. Um, and not to impose a certain set of expectations on that interaction. That, that's what it means to me. Mr. Duran? All of Thank which, you. yeah, all of which um, I think is extremely important. And, and I agree with Leah, the, the, the phrase cultural competency, I think, embraces that better than, cult, than cultural relevancy in, the, in, 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 as a modifier uh, for legal advice. So I would, I would suggest that we think about cultural competency as opposed to cultural relevancy. Duly noted. Anyone else? Okay. Any other comments on strategy? Okay. Let's scroll down a little more, Haley. And again, these are implementation steps that we are going to carefully review once we've gotten the, your consensus on this document. And um, the next draft you see will reflect a little more time on implementation steps. Sandra. I do wanna, uh, yes, please, Mr. Sol. Um, I'm not sure why I'm just sort of stuck on this, but in uh, in this goal number two, for some reason, I'm looking for the word outreach, public outreach, uh, somewhere. It just it just feels like um, public education, public awareness. Um, for some reason, today they seem uh, not as proactive 
and as active as is as, as, as the word or the phrase public outreach or, or using the word outreach somewhere. And so I just I just flagged that it just maybe just the way things are hitting me today. But uh, I, I just share that with you. OK, let me just it's a point well taken. Let me ask if, for example, and again, we'll, we're not going to write write a paragraph by committee, but if, for example, in the goal, um, we say increase access to the legal system through public education, outreach, improved access to legal advice and a legal profession, et cetera, et cetera. Would that cover it, or do you want to see it someplace else? Uh, like, like you said, I'm, I, uh, I, I'll let you play with it the way that, uh, that that you see fit. But for some reason, it seems just more active, more proactive. Uh, okay. Me. But okay. Uh, however you decide to include it, or if it can be included. Okay. Duly noted, though. So I've got that noted as well as Mr. Chairman's reference to competence, cultural competence. Uh, Ms. Hershkovitz. I would just uh, note that the um, the reference um, so following on what what Trustee Sowell just said under consumer focus, where you talk about sort of that same issue, it enhanced public awareness and understanding of the state bar as a resource for access to legal representation. I, I wasn't sure what that meant um, personally um, because we're not. I mean, maybe maybe it's about our are certifying with lawyer referral services, but I wasn't entirely sure what that meant about the public awareness of the state bar serving as a resource for access to legal representation. So Leah, you want to take that? Yeah, I think this was about uh, the lawyer referral services, the, um, the links we have to find legal services organizations. Um, to make sure that there is an awareness that we do provide those types of connections. The, a lot of these implementation steps come from the feedback that was provided by staff. Yeah. Um, and you know, as we said at the onset, th this part of this document, I don't see as being fully finalized, but that is where it came from. And I, my understanding is that's what it was referring to. And I would say staff as well as stakeholders is where some of some of these came from. Mr. Sold, do you still have your hand up because you have another comment or did you just leave it up? My fault, I just left it up. No problem. Anything else in the way of comments on goal two? This has been helpful. All right, let's keep scrolling, please. We're on goal three. I want to include the vision, which is state bar licensees exemplify excellence and personal responsibility in the practice of law. And then you'll see our five year strategies there. Just want to see if there's any comment. Anything that's not clear, any words or language that's missing. I would offer, um, and again, I, I appreciate the reoccurring comment of not wordsmithing it here, um, but I would offer, I would offer just based on the conversation we had earlier today under D policy and systems change, maybe um, something around exploration because what's transpiring right now with the uh, the working group is they're exploring a regulatory sandbox now whether or not the recommendations that they provide are embraced but i feel like the exploration of other alternatives i think it's important to pull i think it's important to incorporate incorporate exploration somehow no matter how you do it so okay appreciate Thank that you. okay appreciate that that's good thank you miss shelby anything else Okay, Haley, let's go to goal four. And the vision here is stakeholders and public are informed about 
and supportive of the state bar's initiatives, achievements, programs, and services. And I think in this section, I want to go back to some of the comments Mr. Broat made, um, you know, relative to and Mr. Tony, relative to how um, how general or how specific we think we ought to be, um, you know, regarding partners. I, maybe the word partner. Um, isn't the, the right word, or it, maybe it's, it only rubs Mr. Broughton the wrong way, but I want to spend a little time on this one if we need to, and, um, and get some feedback and comments. Anyone? Leah, you have some feedback? No, I was going to ask um, Mark if it if it helped him at all to see this, um, you know, the five year strategies. Right. If it provides. Well, I think I think it does to the extent it says uh, stakeholders and partners. Uh, that kind of clears it, uh, makes it a little bit more understandable for me. So we have we we say stakeholders and public. You're okay with that under the vision excuse me public not partners okay and that and you're good with that i guess i i'm still kind of unclear as to how we're going to accomplish it or how we're going to measure it but um as a general proposition i think it describes what in a very general way as mr tony said what we want to do. Mr. Tony, anything to add now that you're looking at it again? Um, <clears throat> I think it's fine for now, um, you know, between- Oh, I want more than that. I mean, I'm fine with it. Okay. You know, if someone has a suggestion, they want to shoot it over before we meet again, we obviously we'll take a look at it. Um, this isn't the end of the process here. We want to document that all trustees feel um, they can support. And that's part of why I joined this committee. And that's part of why I enjoyed working with, uh, with uh, Brandon and Ruben because sometimes we see things divergently. And I thought it was important for us to work together that if we could work together to come up with a um, common document that it would be helpful to the uh, trustees. So anyway, that, that's how I looked at it anyway. Okay. Because, you know, because I do think, uh, you know, to, in, in fairness to Mr. Broughton, that, that it, 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 it's a legitimate request that we either get more specific it is. You know, but I think it's also legitimate that we keep things broad so we give ourselves some flexibility. Um, I, I just want to be sure that that I'm acknowledging that, you know, that we heard his comments and, yeah, you know, I think that's that's fair feedback. Okay, thank you. May, I, may I also, I think, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, sorry, sorry, go ahead. May I also offer this thought too? I, I don't think there's clarity around this dais in terms of partners and stakeholders, right? I still think there's an education piece because we view it differently from our vantage points, right? For, for me, as a public affairs professional, I see stakeholders, I actually see partners as stakeholders. I, I think those terms are interchangeable, but I certainly understand for someone who this language is new, that they would see it very differently. And so I still think we, it goes back to the very opening comment um, as it related to getting back into the strategic planning piece. And I think that question was around the, you know, who was the public? And I think based on what we do professionally, the public means different things. And so at some point in time, we as a board, we've got to at least put our arms around um, how amorphous the public is, right? Because I think we can't, I think it's not as specific as we may think and the public entails so many different things, in my opinion, outside of the legislature and the Supreme Court. Pub public like beauty is in the eyes of the beholder. Absolutely. Okay. Um, Mr. Duran, were you gonna comment? Um, just a little bit insofar as, you know, 
for better or worse, the public is whomever it chooses to engage with us as um, issues under our purview become important or get attention. And we need to have the ability and I think the desire to be responsive when that happens, right? Um, and I don't know whether that concept resonates or it could be encapsulated in any of this verbiage, but practically speaking for me as a member of this board, that's, that's the way I, um, I think even subconsciously uh, perceive the public. And, and it's part of being to me responsive and responsible public servants. Appreciate that. And it goes back to inclusion to me. If we're if we are really being inclusive, it's almost everybody. Yeah. I mean, certainly we don't want to exclude um, somebody who feels like this organization um, and speaking through this body can do something to improve um, their lives or a situation involving a lawyer or involving a you know. And I understand that's super broad, and you know I don't want to open open us up to you know doing everything for everybody. But we have a very specific and defined role as set forth in our um, enabling legislation, and I think that we have a duty to be responsive in that role to quote unquote the public when they come to us. I agree. Okay. Well said. Um, let's scroll down. I don't think we need to any, any much further. Okay, again, there are implementation steps on goal four, but as we said, these are very much in draft form and um, and we're gonna come back to the, to, to come back to this group with a with, with something a little more fleshed out there. So um, I'm, going to say bravo to the to the to all of you and in particular to the working group for you know getting us to a place where we have a document with you know while there's certainly been some valuable input you know quite a bit of consensus around um you know both the goals as well as the language we use and a lot of that was as i said at the outset a lot of that was your language so um my i believe my um piece is goes to action items and next steps. And then I'll turn it back to, to Leah. From our perspective, we're gonna take another look in, in, at the language we um, heard from some of you and some bills that we heard from some of you. And that will then give us another draft to work with and get in front of this group um, after the working group is, is probably taken one more, put one more set of eyes on it. So let me again, thank all of you for the, the real work that was done, um, you know, back in late January, but then also the working group for helping us move it forward. And obviously to uh, my team and to Leah and, and her team for helping us get this into really good place. It's, it is a pleasure, has been a pleasure um, to get to this work to this point. So Leah, I will send it back to you. Yeah, I just, you know, um, we didn't hear from all of you during this discussion. And so I do want to make sure that everybody feels like their voice is heard and their opinions are heard. And so I encourage you, as Mark uh, Tony indicated, to send in your ideas. Um, our working group will, will be meeting um, to discuss the needed revisions identified today, as well as to finalize the proposed implementation steps. So you know, this should be your strategic plan and your vision for the organization. And I just want to make sure uh, that your voices are heard. I personally feel really good about the direction. Um, this process has been entirely different from the last uh, five-year planning session that I participated in, which was right at the precipice of that a separation of the trade association really grappling with trying to understand what our organization would look like uh, without the state bar sections. And I think we are so uh, well beyond that and understand that our role in protecting the public includes, of course, the attorney discipline system, but also these really critical co components of access and diversity. So I feel really uh, happy to see where we are and good about, good about the work, but I want all of you to as well. So Again, just encouraging you to provide your feedback and thank you.
Thank you for that, Leah. Cassandra and your team, thank you for, for uh, the hard work and preparing and for guiding us through this conversation today. Uh, Melanie, I see you have your hand up. Yes, yeah, just a quick question. When will we get to a point of adoption? If someone could clarify the timeline, that'd be great. I'm looking at Mark Tony. I, I would like to see it uh, brought forward to you, uh, Melanie, at the March meeting that may be overly ambitious, um, given that that's about a month away. So if it's not March, it would be May, um, and, and Mark may. No, no you, you, you know, I, I, I do think that March is realistic because of today's meeting, because of the extra work that the working group had to put in to prepare for today's meeting and because of the input that so many trustees provided at today's meeting, um, I have a lot of confidence. I also thought that, you know, there was one um, aspiration that we, you know, get it done in January at one point, this is a few months ago. And I think that um, the, the other factor is Ideally, if we're able to meet in person, we don't know yet, okay, we certainly don't. But that would also make it feel like it's, it's more doable, that we would have um, the ability to have, you know, a, a, a more interactive discussion. We're doing the best we can with Zoom, but it's not the same as being in person, but I'm very optimistic myself. There, there is more news to come on that. Of, oh, of course, of course. And after just as a um, just a quick uh, additional note, after the board adopts a strategic plan, all of the sub entities will then be asked to revise their work plans in accordance with the strategic plan. So it'll trigger uh, a host of other activities uh, in the state bar. It, it also may 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 trigger the finance committee taking another look at the budget that was approved today. So actually, there is some interest and value in adopting it sooner rather than later. Um, in, in addition to the, um, uh, you know, what Leah said about sub entities, um, it also impacts the budget. So that's part of why I'm optimistic and certainly I'll be working towards March. I'm gonna go on a limb and suggest that Brandon and I are gonna join you in that effort very, uh, very gratefully and very happily. Great. Okay, I have to tell you that in a, very, in a this, you know, in a in a strange way, I I want to see the the visuals that are attached to this stuff, you know, the fancy colors and the the neat bullet points and all that because it 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 is impactful. At least it's impactful to me. I'm a very visual learner, so I understand it's probably too much to ask for that in in March, but you know, a guy can dream, can't he? <laughs> Okay, it sounds like we are um, wrapping up close to an hour ahead of schedule, um, which is uh, just fine by me, but certainly this time has been set aside in, in, in all of our calendars. So um, let me just offer one last um, one last seat at the table or one, you know, anybody wanna speak anything else to the strategic planning since that's our agenda item. Okay, seeing none. I'm going to adjourn this meeting with uh, my thanks for all of your participation as always. Look forward to seeing you uh, again soon, hopefully in person. Take care. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Hi, Dag.